The House will come to order. <laughs> Prayer by the Chaplain. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. God Almighty commands us worship God, associating none with Him, and show kindness to parents and to relatives, the orphans and the poor, and to close neighbors and very distant neighbors, and to your companions and foreigners and the captives. Surely God does not love the proud and the boastful. Join me in a moment of prayer. God our Lord, Today we pray to you to increase our faith and teach us kindness. Cause us to be kind to our colleagues in the legislature. Cause us to be kind to our parents. Cause us to be kind to our relatives. Cause us to be kind to the orphans in Minnesota. Cause us to be kind to the poor in Minnesota. Cause us to be kind to our close neighbors who live in our city or township or to our distant neighbors who live in other faraway cities and townships across Minnesota. Cause us to be kind to our companions, to foreigners, to the captives and those imprisoned. And let that kindness be reflected not just in word, but in deed, in laws, and in legislation. Remove from us the sins of pride and boastfulness. These all we ask in all your good names. Amen. Amen. The chaplain for the day is Imam Asad Zaman, Director of Muslim American Society of Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance, please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. Members, please take your conversations into the alcoves or the retiring room. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. <clears throat> journal of the House, 91st session, 2019, 16th day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wednesday, February 27th, 2019. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with, and the journal will stand as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal stands approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business has been placed on each member's desk. If there is no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. Second reading of House Files. Second reading House File number 349. Second reading. Second reading House File number 1501. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House files 1805 through 1923. First reading, House files 1805 through 1923. Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments to concurrence of the House is respectfully request requested. House file number 14, an act relating to elections. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Nelson moves that the House refuse to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 14, that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of three members of the House, and that the House request that a like committee be appointed by the Senate to confer on the disagreeing votes of the two Houses. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson, to your motion. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. That's my motion. Um, they put some amendments on there, and uh, I think we need to go to conference to straighten it out. Discussion to the Nelson motion to refuse to concur. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. Um, uh, I would ask you to vote against uh, this motion. Um, we actually do want to concur with this language. We want to get this money in the hands of the Secretary of State uh, as soon as possible. If we need to come back and do another bite of the apple later uh, to get more money, uh, we can certainly do that. Um, but if we concur with this language, uh, this bill can go to, we can, we can concur with the Senate amendments, we can send this bill to the Governor's desk and the Secretary of State can have this money tomorrow. Um, that's what we're talking about here. So if you vote oh, for yeah, the amendment to not, or excuse me, vote for the motion to not concur, um, you're keeping money from the Secretary of State, just to be clear. Um, I know it may Thank not you. be exactly what you want. Um, you may want more money, uh, but believe me, we can come back and give more money later. Uh, this, this you know, delaying this right now will keep money from the Secretary of State. So I'm certain that's not what you want. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd request a roll call um, on the uh, motion. Representative Doubt requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. I'm, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wasn't quite finished yet. Um, this is an important issue. Uh, the Secretary of State's been waiting a long time for this. Um, I believe we had this money in our omnibus bill last year, and it was vetoed by the governor. Um, Unfortunately, it was vetoed by the governor, um, and the Secretary of State has been waiting for this money. We're the only state in the country now that hasn't given this HAVA money to the Secretary of State. And, and this is money that will help keep our elections safe and secure, and I know there's a lot of things that Secretary of Simon wants to do uh, to ensure that our, our, our elections are secure and safe. Um, so if you vote for this motion, you are voting to keep money from the Secretary of State and delay that. Um, and, 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 you know, I know you want to make sure that the Secretary of State gets money, but here's your opportunity. So it's very important that we defeat this motion to refuse to concur. I'll be happy after that's defeated to make a motion to concur, and then we can pass that off the floor here and, and pass the bill and then get that directly to the governor's desk so he can sign this and get that money in the hands of the Secretary of State soon. Um, our elections are incredibly important, and I think you've seen in recent years uh, in, in other places, uh, the kinds of things that can happen and the potential, uh, you know, we hear the news stories about potential hacking into our election systems. That's exactly what this money is designed to prevent. 
And there was a, a time when we got some dire warning about the fact that our, uh, our election system was hacked into. It doesn't look like anything was done, um, but somebody did breach our system. So we need to make sure together that that doesn't happen. And this is really important funding to make sure that the Secretary of State has the tools that he needs uh, to get that accomplished. Um, and if you vote for this motion to refuse to concur, you are delaying money to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State will not get this money um, if you don't do it. I know you may want him to get more money, and that's fine. We can come back and pass a bill to give him more money next week. But he literally could have this money tomorrow if we can get this bill to the governor's desk tonight. So this is the opportunity to do that. I don't feel like people are understanding what I'm saying. There's just a lot of faces in computers and notebooks. Like, this is an important issue. I think everybody has talked about how important our election systems are and making sure that we keep those safe. I want to make sure we get this money uh, to the Secretary of State as soon as possible. It's important. I know there's plans that the Secretary of State has to, to, to you know, put things in place to prevent bad things from happening and prevent those sorts of breaches or hacking or all those sorts of things. So, you know, voting to, to send this thing to a conference committee uh, isn't going to help the Secretary of State get money fast. Let's get this money in the Secretary of State's hands immediately. And the way to do that is, is to defeat this motion. And let's, I'll personally put the motion in to, to concur. And, and we will pass this bill tonight off the House floor. And we can get it to the governor's office. I'll drive it over there myself if you need me to. We'll get the governor's signature, and the Secretary of State can have access to that money immediately. Tomorrow, he can be putting those plans into place. So let's not miss an opportunity to do what we all know is important and what we all have said that needs to happen, okay? So please vote with me on the motion against this motion to refuse to concur. So I'm asking, I know it's kind of confusing. A red vote is what we want against the motion to refuse to concur. And then that will be followed immediately once that's defeated, which is the right thing to do, that will immediately be followed by a motion to concur. I would make that motion now, but the motion to refuse to concur is a higher priority motion than the, than the motion to concur. So we need to defeat this one first. I know it sounds confusing, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through it one more time here before we're done, um, just to make sure everybody's clear. But a red vote is what we want now. That will help us get money in the Secretary of State's hands soon, okay? So this is a motion to refuse to concur, which would send the bill to conference committee. So we need to defeat that motion, and then I'll immediately make a motion to, to concur. We can pass that. I'll be happy to drive the bill over, although today I'm parked in the little lot right here by the Capitol. And today when I tried to leave the Capitol, snow had gotten into that little security gate that pops up, and, and they couldn't, I couldn't get my car out. So I was literally stuck at, the, in, I, and I, I might be stuck in here all night, I'm not sure. So we might need somebody else to drive the bill over. Do we have a volunteer for that? We'll worry about that. We'll worry about that. Don't worry about that right now. We'll find somebody to bring the bill over. And we will get it signed tonight. But first things first, we have to vote against this motion to refuse to concur. Okay? Once we do that, I'll immediately make the motion to concur. We'll probably have another discussion on that motion. We can pass that, then the bill will be in front of us. We can pass the bill, uh, and then it's on its way to the governor's office if we can find somebody to get it there, okay? And if the gate is fixed, I'll take it there myself, okay? Unless one of you can give me a ride. Either way, we'll get, we'll get this worked out. But first things first, I need you to vote red on the motion to refuse to concur. We'll defeat this motion. We'll have a motion to concur. We'll pass that. We'll then pass the bill. And the Secretary of State can get the money immediately. We'll get the governor's signature. Secretary of State can get the money immediately. And we can actually start protecting our elections like we have all talked about for months and months and months. And you've heard the stories. You know what can happen. You know the hacking. I mean, luckily, somebody didn't get in and actually tamper with our system. They got in. They just didn't tamper with our system. We got lucky. The next time, we likely won't get lucky. And you might think that this isn't a big deal, right? Because the election is a year and a half away. We, ha we literally have an election in next week. 
We have a primary election and a special election to fill a seat in this chamber, our 134th seat in this chamber next week. And two weeks later, we have an election for the general election to fill that seat. So this is incredibly timely, okay? This isn't something we can send to conference committee and deal with in a week or two. We literally have an election next week. If we, and for me to put that into perspective, kind of loud in here, Madam Speaker, if you could just quiet folks down, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. I just, this discussion, is important. Discussion to the Nelson motion to refuse to concur on House File 14. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is important. I mean, I know what you're thinking, no, we can't. We could, we could just send this to conference. The conference committee can meet over the weekend, and we can, we can pass this on Monday and send it to the governor's desk Monday night. We have an election on Tuesday next week. On Tuesday, we have an election. I want to make sure the Secretary of State gets some money to make sure he can protect that election and the integrity of that election now. I don't want to wait until it's too late. Okay? And when you have an election on Tuesday, waiting until the 11th hour on Monday night to get some money in the Secretary of State's hands is too late. So I hope that you all didn't run for election to be in this chamber to tell people you were going to do stuff at the 11th hour and that you were going to get stuff done too late. And I know we tried to do this last year and the governor vetoed the funding. Believe me, I wish that wouldn't have happened. But it's not too late now for us to fix this. It will be too late on Monday, and I don't think, point of parliamentary inquiry, Madam Speaker. Say uh, your point of parliamentary inquiry. Do we have a session over the weekend? Are we going to have a session Friday, Saturday, or Sunday? We have not set the time of reconvening, Representative Doubt. Okay, thank you. So I guess it's not too late for that. If this motion for some reason does pass, um, we could come back tomorrow. Um, we could have conference committee meet tonight. We could come back tomorrow. Um, we could pass the funding. How, you guys want to come back tomorrow? We might still be here tomorrow. All joking aside, this is an important issue. And if you campaigned on getting money into the Secretary of State's hands to protect our elections, this is the vote that you can do that, okay? Monday's too late. We're not, ha we're not having a session. You know, I apologize about the back and forth. I think we all know we're not having a session on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. We're going to come back here Monday at 3.30, just like we always do. And by then, it's going to be too late because we have an election on Tuesday. So let's make sure that we protect the election that we have on Tuesday, and then two weeks later we'll have a general election. Let's make sure we protect the integrity of those elections by giving the Secretary of State the resources that he needs to ensure that we're protecting those elections, okay? And this is our last opportunity to do that. I know you might want more money, but let's get him what we can. And this wasn't my choice. I didn't pass the bill out of the Senate and send it over. Okay, they sent what they were comfortable with right now. Let's tell them, hey, you know, we wish it would have been more, but we're okay with getting that to the governor's desk tonight and to the Secretary of State immediately so that he can start work on protecting our elections. All right? This is an important issue. And this will be your last, I mean, literally, there won't be another bite at the apple. This motion passes and we refuse to concur this thing's headed to conference committee purgatory, okay? And we all know what that looks like. I'm glad I'm not the one negotiating with the Senate all the time. That's a tough job. But in this instance, they put us in this position. We didn't ask for it. So let's, ref let's ref uh, defeat this motion to refuse to concur. Let's take what they've given us and get that in the Secretary of State's hands, and then we'll come back together and I'll help you with the Senate, I promise. But we'll come back for a second bite of the apple. And we can maybe do that next week or the following week. But let's not miss an opportunity to get this money uh, in the hands of the Secretary of State. Would Representative O'Driscoll yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative O'Driscoll, I, I apologize, but I don't have the language on this bill in front of me. So I don't, here it comes. And I don't know the dollar amount that we're talking about. I don't know what the Senate had passed. I, I understand that it's slightly less than what the total amount that could be available is. Um, can you just talk about that for a minute, about what you understand that they have done over there? 
The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you. I want to correct one thing that Representative Dowd said today. He said this was important to him. No, 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 no. This is important to Minnesota. The data that is in the voter registration system, it's my data, it's Representative Dowd's data, it's Speaker Hort, uh, Hortman's data. I can go right down. It's all of us, all 133 of us, the Senate, and all of Minnesota's data that's in this system. And we were shopped. We were shopped by the not-so-nice people. And that system was built in 2000, uh, 2004, when then Secretary Kiffmeyer, now Senator Kiffmeyer, the author of the bill that we're looking at, built a system that stood the test of time. On my way over here this afternoon, I got a call from the Secretary of State. I haven't had a chance to get that call. I don't know what he wanted. But I got a call on my voicemail from the Secretary of State that I need to return to him. Now, I don't know the, the amount that the Senate was looking at, but I will get that information. But here's what I believe that they're doing. They're, I bet that the Senate came to us and said, let's take the amount of money under the provisions, freeing up almost $6 million to the Secretary of State's office by using money that we've already spent, that the, that the feds have given us permission to use, I'll wait till you're done with, with whatever, whatever else you're working on here. I, I, can, I, can, I can hang on for a minute. Then th this is important stuff, folks. No question about it. How they would do this is it wouldn't be with paper ballots. They would go into our voter registration system and they would start deleting voters from your district. Pink, gone. Pink, gone. Oh, that one too. And those people would never even have been in the voter roll. They're gone. I suspect that the language that the Senate was looking at today, the dollar amount, is enough to be able to take the money that the Secretary of State's office has already spent, again, as the feds have agreed to, give us credit, and freeze up almost $6 million so that Secretary Simon can go ahead as our Secretary of State and begin doing programming. He needs four years to be able to accomplish that task. Now, again, as I said, I've got a voicemail. I don't know what he's, what he's asking. I don't know what he, what he wants. But I can tell you this. I've been around this place long enough to know that conference committee isn't magic. When you go to conference committee, you hope you can get a deal together. Senators come on one side. House members come on the other side. It's usually bipartisan. You fight for your position. What happens if the Senate says that they're not interested in, in, uh, in our position? We have this one opportunity right here today to be able to, as Leader Dowd said, get the ball rolling, folks. We can at least get the system pointed in the right direction. I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I would, would, if I was thinking about this today. I don't know if I want to take the gamble. I'm going to back Leader Doubt on this one today, folks. Representative Doubt, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I didn't exactly hear the answer to my question, but it may be because you didn't have the bill in front of you, and I, my staff, uh, while you were speaking there, um, did bring it over. So uh, this, this would, just for the, for the body's edification here, um, this would put in the hands of the Secretary of State $1.534 million, uh, basically immediately. Um, and another 163,000 uh, from the general fund. So, um, and this is money that that comes from the federal government uh, for this purpose. Uh, this is important. Um, you know, it says in it says in the language of the bill. If you haven't read it, maybe you can request it. Um, the, our very capable pages here could run a copy over to if you press your little page button on your desk. Um, but uh, the the. You know, this is for the purpose of modernizing, securing, and updating the statewide voter registration system, and for cybersecurity upgrades as authorized by federal law. Um, this is important, you know, and, and I would love to say, oh, we can just let this wait until the end of session. Um, in the next two weeks, we have two elections. 
Um, this isn't something that we can just put off until you know November of, of, of 2020 because we don't have any elections coming up. Um, this is important. Um, so I want to make sure that we get this money in the hands of the Secretary of State immediately. Um, would Representative Nelson yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, um, just because I don't know exactly what's going to happen, and I feel like I've made really compelling arguments here on the floor, um, and I, my hope is that we can pass this, that we, I, I always hate to, you know, when a chair stands up and, and makes a motion to refuse to concur, um, I always hate to speak against their bill, uh, you know, because I know you've worked a lot on this and, and you'd like to see this a little different. You want to go to a conference committee and have an opportunity to negotiate. Um, but we've all seen how that works um, in conference committee, how, you know, we send the bills to conference committee, but somehow the conference committee never really meets. Um, and there's all these behind-the-scenes negotiations that nobody sees or hears. Um, and then all of a sudden, we show up in conference committee for a 15-minute hearing where there's an amendment with language that came out of thin air. Um, and there's no public discussion about that or opportunity for people to react. Um, so my question for you, Representative Nelson, um, if, and I, I, I hate to say this, if I haven't made a compelling enough argument and for some reason this motion to refuse to concur does pass, um, and, and this thing does go to conference committee, will you commit to me and this body uh, that these negotiations on this issue, which is incredibly important, would you commit to us that they will only happen in a public, open, and transparent conference committee for the public to see and for the public to come in and testify on and not behind closed doors? Can you make that commitment to us? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. That's the, way, that's the way conference committees are supposed to meet. And Representative Doubt, if that was the only reason, if that was the only difference was the dollar amount that you're talking about, Representative O'Driscoll talked about $6.6 .6 million. They've lowered the amount to the 1.5 or whatever it is here. I'm just, I just got a copy of their language. But it's not so much the dollar amount because that's, if it was just the dollar amount, I wouldn't have, I would have agreed with you that we could, pass this, get it passed, get it to the governor's desk to get the money started and add the additional money later on. But it's they added other language to this bill, other language that changes our election structure and changes things that the Secretary of State has to do and makes, makes things more complicated. It's not just the money, which the original bill was just authorizing the money that the federal government gave us that authorizing the Secretary of State to spend that dollars for the upgrading of our system. And if that's all that they did was lower that amount to the amount of money we had in last year's bill, I guess I would be okay with that. But they added language that talk about reporting, uh, doing updates on other things to this bill that that it has nothing to do with getting the Secretary of State money to oper update our systems. And because of that stuff that's in the system, that is stuff that we need to discuss and need to talk about in an open committee hearing. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you, Representative Nelson. I was really unaware of what you just said, and I likely am going to have a follow-up question for you. Um, that, that, and I, I just personally, and I think you know that just from the passion that I'm displaying here now, I personally feel like we need to get this million and a half dollars and some change into the Secretary of State's hands immediately. Um, you know, so my staff, as you were speaking, were just kind of filling me in on some of the background. Um, so there's two different subdivisions that I think, and I'm going to ask you a question if, 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 if you'll agree to yield for a question. Um, if he would, Madam Speaker, would he yield for a question? He's thinking about it, but it looks like maybe yes. Yes, I think he will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So the way that I, that I read the language, it's subdivision four and subdivision five, um, and then it's that, that uh, those are in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong, section one and section two, and section three is the funding. So that's the part where you said if it was just the funding, um, you likely would agree with me and we'd send this bill uh, to the governor's desk tonight to get them, you know, at least get them started with the million and a half. Um, so it looks like the sections one and two are the parts that you probably have an, an issue with. Um, it's my understanding, and I, I might be wrong, you might have been included in discussions uh, behind closed doors or 
hopefully not in the dark of night, um, between the governor's office and the Senate. But, but it's my understanding that the governor's office had instructed the Senate to pull any non -con or excuse me, to pull any controversial language out of this bill. Um, and the word that I got was this section one and section two are non-controversial. Um, and those actually, that's the same language from the bill that we passed last year that was included in the bill that the governor vetoed. Um, and I know that this wasn't the reason he vetoed that bill, but, um, and it's also my understanding that the Secretary of State already uh, compiles these reports and that these really are non-controversial language pieces. So if you could comment for me what it is about section one and section two uh, that would make those controversial or why those are a drastic change in our election system uh, or election process and procedure, um, I I'd appreciate hearing what it is about those because I understand those to be non-controversial. Representative Nelson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Doubt. Again, those pieces, number one, no one, when I walked in today into session, I was told that the Senate passed the bill. I had been told up until now that they were not passing the bill. They were not even hearing the bill. So it was a shock to me when I walked in here, not having seen any language, what they had passed, what they had done. I hadn't had any behind the scene discussions with the Secretary of State or the Governor's Office. No one contacted me saying that this is okay. And that is why I'm saying if if it had been just the, the last section of this, the money piece was different, I might, have not, I might not have made my motion to, to refuse to concur. But because this language here, and yes, they do, do do some of these reports, but because I did not see this language until two minutes ago or three minutes ago when I was handed, the, handed a copy of the bill that the Senate passed, that is why I refuse to concur. We need to go and talk about this. And if the Secretary of State and the Governor say, yep, yep this, that's okay, maybe we can have an agreement, but we need to have that discussion. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and if he would yield for another question. He will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, I, I apologize. I didn't catch what it is about this language that you see as controversial and why you would be opposed to it. Um, and I, normally I wouldn't go through this exercise, but literally we have elections coming up on Tuesday. Um, we have an opportunity to get some of this money in the hands of the Secretary of State right now. Um, if we don't do this, if we, if we accept your motion to concur, or excuse me, refuse to concur, um, and this bill goes to conference committee, it's too late for next week's election, right? We're, we're, we're coming in a day late and a dollar short, if that's the case, literally. Uh, actually, a million and a half dollars short, um, and, and at least a day late. But the, the reality is, knowing that those are what the, the, the consequences and odds, this pretty high stakes game here that we're playing. You know, it's kind of like a chicken between the House and the Senate. Um, and, you know, we want our way, so we're going to send this to conference committee. Um, but what, and, and this happens too much around here then who loses are the Minnesotans that expect us to just roll up our sleeves and work together. Um, so I didn't, and I apologize, I didn't hear specifically about section one and section two. What is it about those that, that you object to or, or, or don't want to accept this bill for that reason? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members and Representative Doubt. I'd object to the fact that I have not seen this language till it was handed to me right now. I don't know all the particulars of this. I haven't had a chance to confer with the governor. I haven't had a chance to confer with the Secretary of State. I don't have a phone message on my phone from him t telling me that it's okay or not okay. And so that is the reason why I'm objecting. And even if we get this money, even if we pass this bill today and send it to the governor and you drive it over to the governor, I mean, if you can't get your car out, I'll, 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 let you, I'll drive you over there. If, but even if you can't, we got this money to the governor today. This money's not going to help us in Tuesday's election, and it's not going to help us in next Tuesday's, in two weeks' election, the special election, because what this money was for, and the, and the Secretary of State said this in committee, it's for hiring the money he needs. He's going to use it to hire, I think he said, three people or four people to, to, to program, to write, write code for the next election, and that's not going to help by doing this that they're not going to be able to get that code written by Tuesday's election, even if we pass this today. So, yes, it is important that we get this money to the Secretary of State's office. Yes, it is important that we protect our election system. But 
passing it today or getting it done right is, is um, not going to matter in this next Tuesday's election. We need to do it right, and we need to get this money to the Secretary of State, the whole amount. Uh, thank Representative you. Doubt. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Nelson. Um, maybe if you would, I'm going to talk just a little bit longer. Um, if you would just get a copy of that language. In fact, uh, if a page could come up here uh, to me. Oh, you've got it. You've got the language. Okay. If you could just review, I was just going to send mine over to you um, so that you could re review that language. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Representative O'Driscoll uh, about this language because I think he carried this last year and would probably know about that language and can help shed a little light. So let's try to get to the bottom of this now before we send this bill to, to conference committee purgatory where nobody's going to see money for weeks and weeks and maybe months and months. Um, so if, if uh, Representative O'Driscoll would yield for a question. Uh, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative O'Driscoll, and I, I, and I happen to glance over and see that you weren't in your chair the whole time that I was having that back and forth with, uh, with Representative Nelson, but um, the, the part of this that, that he seems to have trouble with, he's okay with Section 3, which is the money. Uh, that's the million and a half dollars uh, and then the 163000 of of general fund. And I think it sounds like he's okay with getting that to the governor for a signature and to the Secretary of State immediately, but he has questions about sections one and section two, um, voter records updated due to vo voting report and inactive voter report. And, and the, the word that I got was that the Secretary of State already compiles these reports and it's fairly non-controversial language, uh, but staff has informed me that this was maybe language you carried last year. Would you be willing to shed some light on that um, as to whether that's controversial or not? Um, and if the Secretary of State uh, already compiles those reports so that we hopefully we can get just get this bill to the governor tonight. So uh, if you could just answer those questions, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Doubt, to your question and the uh, part of the question that's before the body right now, the two parts that are in uh, the subdivisions in this bill are pieces of legislation that I did author last year, and they are reports that are generated uh, post-election, and they're required to be out within two weeks, and it's the updated um, voter roll report, and it's the inactive voter roll. Very benign pieces of information that were again in the omnibus bill that Governor Dayton uh, had vetoed and we included those as a part of the state government finance right along with section 3 information in here as well which is the funding component that we're talking about that the Senate um, had sent over and we're uh, debating whether to concur or not to concur with the Senate. And, and Leader Doubt, um, I, I know you said you would be interested in driving that bill over to the Governor. I, if you thought it would help, I would run shotgun with you on that, and then I could go up to the door with you, and then when they let us in, I could explain to the governor what happened, because I've been very, very closely tied to this in the last, uh, probably, I don't know, 24, 18 to 24 months. So I'll put that out there if you're interested. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. What I took away from that was this really is kind of non-controversial language. I'm looking for just a vis visual cue here of a head nod. I don't need to ask you to yield, but yeah, okay. Um, and, and, and as you were talking, I was kind of reading through it myself, and, and this stuff doesn't look like it should be a stumbling block um, to, to hold this money up. Uh, so it, it would be my hope, and I, I'm hoping other members have had a chance now, because you're going to have to vote on this uh, motion to refuse to concur here shortly. Um, I, I, my hope is that other members have had a chance to read this and kind of uh, be able to absorb the language and talk to staff as I have been able to. I've actually been here speaking on the floor and still able to concur with staff uh, about whether this language is non-controversial. So I, my hope is that you haven't had the speaking role that I have here for the last 40 minutes um, and uh, that you've had time to actually review the language that you're about to vote on. If Representative Nelson would yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, just wanted to follow up. Did you have a chance to review the language a little bit while we were talking here? And um, based on Representative O'Driscoll's answers, do you have any more level of comfort about uh, that this shouldn't be a hold up to getting money in the Secretary of State's hands immediately? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and Representative Doubt. I still have concerns, and I want to, like I said, I haven't had, had a chance to confer with the Secretary of State. I haven't had a chance to confer with the Governor to, about, this, about this language. 
the bill I passed, and I passed off the floor here with an overwhelming vote that we had on the floor, um, is the language that the Secretary of State has told me that he prefers in the past. I haven't heard anything different from that. We need to go to conference, and if the Secretary of State sits in the conference committee, we can have that Monday. We could have that. We could have that over the weekend if he wants. We can have we can have a meeting, and we can get get this done if they if we if the, if the uh, speaker appoints us the uh, conference committee and the Senate appoints their conference committee. We can get this done. We can have open meetings, and we can be told that the language they want, and then we can get this passed. So, Mr. Madam Speaker. My motion is to refuse to concur, and I, can, I stand on my motion. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, I'm, I'm, and, and I appreciate Representative Nelson, and it sounds like you want to get the money there quickly. Um, what I'm trying to do is help us get it there more quickly, um, and I'm just, I, I'm really concerned that if we wait through the weekend and we don't pass this until, you know, if, even if the conference committee meets over the weekend, which I can pretty much guarantee you is not going to happen, um, and, and I really do hope that you'll commit to, to having that conference committee, I mean, if this motion passes and this does go to conference committee, I really hope that you'll commit to having that conference committee open in public in a transparent way where people can participate in the process. I want to see the negotiations. I don't want a horse trading to happen in the dark of night behind closed doors. I want to see it. Um, but because you said you still just haven't had time to review this, um, and, and frankly, uh, you know, I'm hoping Let's take a little time. I, I appreciate your, your position. Let's take some time and review this before we make even this decision. Because when we make this decision, we will delay money going to the Secretary of State's office. Um, I think this is an important enough issue that we shouldn't delay it. But yet I understand we need to get that decision right. So um, I'm going to make a motion to table this motion to refuse to concur. Um, so that we can have a little more time and, and, and not table it until Monday or whatever. I want to bring it back up tonight. But in the meantime, let's do a little due diligence. Somebody talk to the Secretary of State. Somebody talk to the Governor. Uh, somebody review this language. Doubt, a motion to table is not debatable. All those I, I haven't made the motion yet. I just said I was going to make the motion. I'm still debating the motion to refuse to concur if it's okay, Madam Speaker. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, so, you know, this is important. Um, you know, I... I don't want to delay. I don't want to wait until Monday. We've got elections literally happening on Tuesday in this state. And, and, and we don't, we, we're literally the only state in the country that hasn't accessed this HAVA money. We tried last year, it got vetoed. And we've got elections coming up Tuesday of next week. I, I, we, this isn't something that can wait to go to conference committee purgatory. So let's Let's take a little time right here tonight um, and, and, you know, somebody call the Secretary of State, somebody call the Governor, let's find out if this language could be acceptable. Believe me, when the bill comes back with, with the, or the next version of this bill with the additional remaining funding, I'll co-author it with you, I'll stand on the floor and make a motion to suspend the rules to take it up immediately. And I know, Representative Nelson, that you didn't create this. The Senate sent this language over, and now all we can do is react to it. But I think reacting by sending it to Conference Committee purgatory is exactly the wrong move. That's only going to delay money that we know the Secretary of State needs. So we need to take a little time here tonight to make sure that we get that right. Okay? So with that, Madam Speaker, I'm going to make a motion to, to table this motion to refuse to concur. Did you and I'll request roll a roll call on that Let motion. Let me confer with the chief clerk on that. Representative Doubt requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The motion to table is not debatable. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 73 nays, the motion to table does not prevail. The member for Mysanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I don't know exactly how to take this. Um, so we're not tabling, which either means I have been compelling in my argument that we need to, to defeat the motion to refuse to concur and, and pass this bill here, accept the Senate amendments, pass this, send it to the governor, get his signature, and get this money in the, in the hands of the Secretary of State immediately, or I have not been compelling. And, and that might hurt my heart if we didn't... I've, I've invested a lot into this now. Um, but I, and all joking aside, this issue is really important. And if you want to get money into the hands of the Secretary of State immediately, this is the best way to do that. I know it's not the whole amount that is sitting in the account waiting, but we literally are the last state in the country to authorize access to this HAVA money. And that means our elections aren't as secure as they could be. And it means that we have potential uh, vulnerabilities for somebody to hack into our systems and for somebody to meddle around in our elections. And we know how much attention that has gotten in the, in the, in the national media. So we know there are people out here, bad actors, who are trying to do that. That's what makes this so timely and important. And believe me, I wish we weren't here on Thursday at 420, knowing that this is going to be our last session this week, and our next bite at the apple is going to be next Monday at 330, when we have elections coming up on Tuesday of next week, primary election, and another election, a general election, two weeks after that. Let's get this money in the hands of the Secretary of State right now. And this is the best way to do that. But in order to do that, we have to defeat this motion to refuse to concur. And I know sometimes it's tough to vote against your chair. My hope is, and I didn't ask him if I've changed his mind or not, and I'm not going to. But my hope is that he sees that, that the language that was in front of him in sections uh, one and two are really non-controversial language. And that's not a reason to send this bill to conference committee purgatory. And my hope is that he's going to vote red, and he's going to help us defeat this motion to refuse to concur, and then we can immediately follow up with a motion to concur. We can adopt the Senate amendments, repass this bill, and send it to the governor's desk tonight. This is your last chance, okay? It's your last chance to do it. We're not going to delay and, and, and table this bill for a little bit to do a little more research. You got the language in front of you. It's really simple. Two pages, sections one, two, and three. The chair has already said he agrees with the most important part of this, which is section three, and he would send that tonight. So you have to decide before you press your button whether you agree with sections one and two and whether you think those are important enough that we're going to delay money getting to the Secretary of State that we're going to go into an election with vulnerabilities in our election system, that we're not going to shore this up and make sure that we're as strong as we could be. You have to decide if sections one and two are important enough to delay getting money to the Secretary of State. That's the, that's the question you have. Because when you, when you, in less than five minutes, when you press your button on this motion, well, I don't know. I guess I'm done speaking, but uh, others may want to chime in on this. Um, and, and hopefully I've tugged at your heartstrings a little on how important this is. And I hope we do have a good debate here on the floor about it. But the reality is, this is pretty innocuous language on reports that the Secretary of State already compiles. This isn't the meat of the bill. The meat of the bill, the chair agrees with. And he wants to get that money to the Secretary of State. The best way to do that is to vote red on this motion, and then we'll immediately make a motion to, to, uh, to concur with the Senate language, Senate amendments, okay? 
I know this is the first time we've done this this session. We got a lot of new members here. It seems a little clunky. Motions to refuse to concur. And you know, by the time we get done with this, we'll have about four votes just to get this bill to the governor's desk. Um, but it is important. If you fail your first test and we vote to refuse to concur, we're done with this issue tonight. It doesn't come back. We don't get to debate it anymore. We're not going to take another vote. This thing is going to go to conference committee where we may not see it again for three months. And if you think I'm kidding about that, ask some senior members around here how long conference committee purgatory is. By the way, there are bills that have gone to conference committee purgatory to die. No, nobody's ever seen them again, right? I know this might not be perfect. I know it might not be exactly what you want. But this is a million and a half dollars to help shore up our election system immediately. We can have this signed by the governor tonight with elections coming up literally on Tuesday of next week. I know you don't always around here get to choose the optimal timing that things happen. And when you deal with the Senate, and freshmen might not totally understand this term yet, there's something around here that we call Senate time. Things don't start on time. People don't show up on time. That's what we call Senate time. In the House, we start on time. And I want to thank you, Madam Speaker, because during my four years as Speaker, we started this session every day on time on the second, not a second late. And Madam Speaker, I want to thank you personally because you have started session on time every day. And, and I think that is very important because people show up in this chamber ready to work and ready to make decisions. And it's a good thing that you showed up today ready to work and ready to make decisions because this is an important one. It's in front of you right now. And I hope you have the language. I gave you plenty of time. I instructed you on how to press the page button and have them bring out the language so you could read it. Raise your hand if you don't have it. I'll send mine to you right now. But you're about to send a bill. If you vote green on this motion, you will send this bill to Conference Committee Purgatory. And then we have less than a 50-50 shot at getting any money to the Secretary of State. Why? Because now you have to negotiate with the Senate. And they're going to be on Senate time, and they're going to think they're more important and smarter than we are, because that's how it works over there. But we're the house of the people, and we're more in touch with the people. We have a little more common sense over here. And that's why I'm hoping that you have enough common sense right now to have looked at sections one and two in this bill and determined whether those are problematic enough that we should delay this and have less than a 50-50 shot at ever getting money to the Secretary of State. OK? We're the last state in the country to do this. It's non-controversial. 49 others have already done this, OK? Over some innocuous language that does nothing on a bunch of reports that are already created. That's how we're going to stop this from getting to the Secretary of State. And I know many of you campaigned that you wanted to make our election system safer. So this is your opportunity. I hope everybody's really clear on the process. Because I know that part's a little confusing. One last time, you need to vote red on the motion to refuse to concur and defeat that. If you vote green and that passes, this bill goes to conference committee and no money for the Secretary of State. If you vote red, I or probably many other people will stand up immediately and make a motion to concur. Then we're going to adopt the Senate amendments to the bill. We're going to repass the bill. and. I, Tim O'Driscoll, and it sounds like Representative Nelson, the three of us are going to drive the bill to the governor's residence and get his signature, hopefully tonight. OK? That's what we're talking about. All right? So I'm going to wrap up now. And I didn't wrap up sooner because I wanted this to sink in a little bit. It's, it is an important decision. OK? So please, I hope that you have read the language. I hope that you understand the ramifications of what you're about to vote for. Because if you vote green, no money for the Secretary of State. If you vote red, 
we'll jump through a couple more hoops, and it means money for the Secretary of State. It shouldn't be any simpler than that, right? Uh, I know it's confusing because the green and red seem mixed up. If you vote green on this next vote, no money for the Secretary of State. If you vote red on this next vote, good chance we'll have some money tonight for the Secretary of State to protect our elections, which are happening next Tuesday. Please don't screw this up. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, in all seriousness, this is an important piece of legislation. Now, some people here may be going, oh, wasn't that funny that Leader Doubt stood up and started making all those different kinds of things, some of the banter that's gone back and forth. But this may be your only chance this session. I was uh, on the elections committee at one time with, uh, with Majority Leader Winkler. Remember that? Yeah. And uh, Rep Representative Winkler and I used to sit next to each other on the elections committee. When, well, boy, it's old home week here because the Secretary of State used to be the chair of that committee. And you and I would kind of banter back and forth on the different things, and you had a bill, and you said, Representative O'Driscoll, if we go to a conference committee, I'd like to have you on that conference committee. Do you remember what I told you? I said, I'm going to vote no on it, and you said, that guarantees you to get on the conference committee. Do, do you remember that at all? No. It was a good story. But nonetheless, in all seriousness, right, in all seriousness, what happens if we go to conference committee purgatory and the Senate goes, take it or leave it? And we go, well, okay, we'll take it. We could have done that today and got the process underway. Or we go to conference committee, we go, well, we can't get it done. Let's meet next week. Let's meet the week after that. I know I can, in good conscience, go back to the people in my district and say, I did my job because I carried it in 18. I authored the bill in 19. I stood up on the House floor to try to get it, in, it, 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 when, it when it came up from the Senate, and it just didn't happen. Members just didn't have the appetite to secure the state, de, state's uh, voter registration system. So I would strongly encourage people to take off their hats, put them on their desk, and think clearly. Think clearly about what this is. It's not a political get you got you. It's not a procedural deal. It's the real McCoy, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And because we do have a lot of people that don't remember the probable author of this language from the Senate was an august member of the House, but also was a Secretary of State when the current system was designed, implemented, and first used. And I think, M Madam uh, Speaker, Representative Kwam, you have the floor. Right. Ma Madam Speaker, we're a very diligent body, and I believe that it's appropriate that all of us have a copy of the language we're going to be voting about before us. I know that normally when it comes up, we, we don't, but we've had quite a bit of debate. So what is the proper way to... Uh, to be able to ensure that each member of this body actually has a copy of the language that we're debating and has an opportunity to see it. Representative Kwam, you could press your page button and ask for a copy of the bill. Madam Speaker, I'm talking about every single member of this body who takes our job and service seriously, who should have a copy of this bill before them to reference and look at and read before a vote is actually taken. That is something we normally do if an amendment is, is forward. Um, and I, I just think that we as a body, because apparently this is a very important issue, right? Election and take it is important. Ought to actually have taken the time and received the opportunity and read it. Read the words before you make this vote. Read the words before you make this decision. 
be informed and do due diligence for our uh, citizens. And, and apparently uh, that isn't important enough, so I'll go sit down and we can take our vote. Further discussion on the motion? The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as many of you know, I do cybersecurity for a living. I'm on the uh, sort of the, the marketing end of things, but I have a long history in that and uh, was hoping to make sure that you all understand what it is that you're going to vote or not vote for. Uh, I think it's important. So I, I thought. I'm on the marketing end of things, and I'm sort of the, uh, the cybersecurity evangelist, but um, I wanted to ask if Representative Lucero would yield to a question, Madam Speaker. He will. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Lucero, you've looked at these bills closely. You and I have had, had extensive conversation about them. Uh, both you and I are passionate about this issue. Obviously, well, it sort of puts food on the table for both of us. Representative Lucero, can you tell us the 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 most important things that are in this bill that are going to make uh, our election system far more secure? Because I, I think that not everybody over there, Madam Speaker, if we could get uh, quiet in the chamber. Members, please take your conversations to the alcove or the retiring room. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Lucero, not everybody on that side of the aisle or even some of our own freshmen uh, have had, or even some of our senior members, have had the benefit of being in committee uh, for this bill, but I, I thought a good practitioner's perspective on what this does and what it should do would be in order. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, can you help us understand some of the most critical infrastructural pieces that this bill is going to address uh, in our election system? Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Nash. As I've been listening to this discussion, uh, I've been thinking to myself that exact point. And I was reminded some of the lessons that I taught my students when I taught college for seven years in the areas of computer forensics, computer security, voice and data communications, computer law, and other courses. And one of the things that I would explain to my students, and each of us, if we think back to perhaps middle school science, think of water. So we learn in middle school science, water has three forms. It can be a solid, it can be a liquid, or it can be a gas. And I use that analogy to speak about data, data in digital form. Because like water, digital data can be, or is, not can be, is in one of three forms. Digital data is either being transmitted, that's data in motion, it is either being processed, or it's being stored, and that's data at rest. And regardless of the form that data is in, whether it's being transmitted, processed, or stored, protecting the information is incredibly important. And each of those forms of data has its own unique methods of protection. So for example, when data is in motion, could be over the internet, known as a public network, an insecure network, could be Wi-Fi. Much of us or many of us are familiar with Wi-Fi. Maybe you, you've gone to the library or a coffee shop or here on the House floor or in the state office building. We have a Wi-Fi signal. And it's being transmitted and anybody and everybody who has a, a Wi-Fi device can see the wireless signal. And when data is being transmitted, it's either going to be in the clear text or it can be encrypted. And if one wants to, as I'm explaining to my students, when we're seeking to protect digital information, we want to encrypt it while it's in motion. And you know, I've been hearing these commercials recently 
about VPNs. VPN as an acronym stands for Virtual Private Network. And that's one of the methods of protecting data in motion when it's being transmitted by encrypting it from end to end so that when it's traveling over an insecure network like the internet, people that might be able to see that there's data in motion, but they can't see what's being transmitted. And then we have data at rest. So data at rest is exactly what it sounds like. It could be data that's maybe only opened up once every couple hours, couple days, maybe weeks, or it could be archived for long-term storage, months or years. Now, I don't know the policies of the Secretary of State's office, but I know that when we go to the website, we can select past elections. And we can narrow it down as, you know, to the precinct level. And in a precinct level, we can see state votes. We can see votes for local municipal, like uh, the city council offices. We can see school board, right? And we can go back many years. I don't even know how many years we can go back, but it's many. And in order to go back and make that selection, we have to tap into data it in, that's in storage. And we know that we want to protect that information. So I'm hoping that that information at rest, that data in storage, is being protected. Now, just like data in motion has unique aspects to protect it, so does data in storage. And so one of the examples of our common methods of protecting data in storage or at rest is also encryption. But it's a different kind of encryption because it's not a VPN. You don't use a VPN to protect data in storage. VPNs are, are used for data in motion. When it's in storage, one of the methods that uh, you could use or not could use, you do use, is an encryption algorithm that it's encrypted with perhaps what's called a public key infrastructure, where there's a public and a private key. And so you encrypt the information with the key, and then you would put the key in a secure place. Uh, Madam Speaker, it's getting kind of loud in here, and I want to make sure this is very important. Very important. Members, please take your conversations off the House floor into the alcoves or the retiring room. Representative Lucero, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So if you could imagine, when you're, making, when you're on the Secretary of State's website, and I'm hoping actually some of you, some members here, might actually be navigating to the Secretary of State's website right now, because you can actually follow along with what I'm speaking of. When you're there, you can navigate to the elections and past elections. And when you make the menu selection for past years, you're, like I mentioned, you're tapping into to archive data. And that data, again, hopefully it's encrypted. So when I'm looking at this, and as I was listening to the, the, the other members speaking as I'm reading the bill, by the way, I, I should mention uh, when Minority Leader Doubt was encouraging members, and I actually heard Representative Kwam encouraging members to get a copy here. It's not even if you, it's, it's two-sided, but there's a lot of header information on here, and it's really only one page. And of that one page of text, section three, my understanding is that's the, the previous language, that's from last year. And so we should be familiar with section three of the bill. That's not new information for the most part, is my understanding. So really then, there's only a half a page. That'd be section one and section two. And it's so short that it can be read. In fact, I read it several times, just in my sitting, listening to other speakers. And so when I'm reading this, this to me seems like it's uh, something we want to do right away. We don't, we want to not, we want to we defeat the motion. 
of refusing to concur. Because this can, we can look at this, and we can make a decision, we can do our job, and we can do it effectively, efficiently, with the confidence of Minnesota. But back to encryption and back to cybersecurity, which is what Representative Nash was asking me about. So I'm, I apologize there, Madam Speaker, for the tangent. So I mentioned data in motion and data at rest. Those are the three forms, including data being processed, three forms that data can be in. But there are other methods for cybersecurity. Another very common one is authentication. And I'm sure each and every one of us here is familiar with authentication because most of us in here have a mobile device of some kind. And on that mobile device, I'm hoping that you have a pin or some kind of a pattern to get into your mobile device. Proving that you are who you say you are and that you're authorized to be able to access that device. Because what's on the mobile device? Private information that you wouldn't want others to see. And that's a way of ensuring that those that are authorized to access the information are indeed the only ones that do access the information. Because if we don't authenticate, then we don't know who's accessing what, and we might violate the trust of ensuring that information is protected. So, but then when it comes to authentication, over the years, we've seen an evolution of the capabilities of authentication. And authentication, you know, we in the cybersecurity industry, we like threes. M many of these things come in threes. And so we have single factor authentication. We have two factor authentication, and some people may have heard of that, some members. But now we're seeing three factor authentication. And when it comes to three factor authentication, what that means is it's proving something you know something you have, and something you are. Those are the three factors. So an example of something you know would be a password. And so your password may have been compromised. And if your password's compromised, somebody else might know the same thing you know, and therefore that would be a compromise of authentication. Because now somebody else has breached the mechanism of authentication. So that's why we, went, we, we see an evolution many years ago now of two-factor authentication. And it can be any of those three. So in other words, you pick two of the three factors of authentication. And generally what that was years ago was something you know combined with something you have. And that something you have is generally a token, a token that's issued. And therefore you have, and that token could be, in the modern day, it's an app on your mobile device. So it's something you have. So combining something you know, and you know, for those of you who have the blue check mark on Facebook and Twitter, I'm seeing several nods here. Several people have uh, identified and have the blue check mark. You then, in order to log into your social media account, you need to engage in what's called two-factor authentication because a PIN is emailed to you. And you read that six-digit code, six-digit PIN as something you now have. And that's a way of combining two factors. But then we get to the third factor, which we are seeing in use in a growing number of applications. And that's something you are. And something you are is biometrics. And we're seeing different examples of biometrics. You know, I used to work at a company where in order to access the data center, you had to do a palm scan. That was a method of a factor of authentication, something you are, biometrics, because it actually scanned the palm. And so I had to enter the pin, that'd be something I know, combined with the palm scan. Something I am combined with 
the badge, if I can get it out of my pocket here, we had badges at this company, something I have. So in order to access the data center, I had to pass the three factors of authentication. Now, I don't know where the Secretary of State is keeping or storing the data. It's not under the purview of Minute, is my understanding, because Minute is separate from the Constitutional Office. So the data is being stored somewhere. And when I'm reading this language, see if I can find it here, it's something to the effect, I was handed another copy of the same language, but thank you. What I failed to do when I was reading it uh, numerous times is to highlight, but something, it's just generally speaking about cybersecurity upgrades. Oh, here it is, right here, it's line 2.11. Modernizing, securing, and updating. I'm hoping that the Secretary of State is housing the data when it's at rest in a data center with three factors of authentication. With duplicate backups, yeah, absolutely. And off-site backups. In fact, I, even got, I have not gotten to backups yet. Yes, ba backups, off, and that's a whole other subject we'll get to. But it is part of cybersecurity for sure. So again, just going back now to the three factors of authentication, something you are. So that was a palm scan, personal example of that. Now, but their biometrics is more than just a palm scan. Another one is a retina scan. I personally haven't been in a place that I've had to do a bio, or I should say a biometric of my eye for the third factor of authentication. But I've seen it out there. I've read news articles about it. And as we continue to get more advanced, there are going to be more methods and capabilities of proving that we are who we say we are using the third method of authentication of what we are. So again, that's authentication. But uh, Representative Nash here, he mentioned uh, backups. So backups, oh, y you know what? My degree, computer forensics. Now most think of computer forensics, the idea that you might think about is investigations of some kind of a crime. And that absolutely is what computer forensics is, but that's not its entirety. Computer forensics could be as simple as recovering information that was failed, that, that, was, that there was a failed plan of backups. In fact, I have been the unfortunate victim of that myself. And when your hard drive fails, and I'm hoping nobody in here has suffered a hard drive failure. Because when you do, and if you have, for those that have, for those members that have suffered a hard drive failure, it's a panic attack. Because most fail to have backups. It's like you've just lost a limb. You know, there was a time, you know, some people actually, you know, I don't know if it's warranted or unwarranted, but some people have called me or told me that I'm very active in taking pictures and putting them up on social media. Yeah, exactly. That's, I have had that claim against me. And there was a time when I do have the blue check mark, actually, to get into my social media. And so, therefore, I have to, to uh, get the pin. And you know what happened? My browser is being registered by Facebook. And I'm typically logged on with multiple devices. And what I did here at the at State Office Building is I logged on to my social media account using my laptop while I was logged in on a different device. And you know what happened? The capabilities of social media, in this case Facebook, they detected that I'm logged on. I'm, there's a second authentication attempt to my account while I'm logged in somewhere else. And they flagged that. And you know what they did? They locked my account. They locked my account. 
and I was not able to log in. And you know what happened to me? I didn't have a panic attack. But it was like I lost my left arm. Because I actually had pictures from constituents that I wanted to put up. And I had to delay. But that, that feeling, that overwhelming sense of dread, of the inability to access the information, is the exact same that I felt when I suffered a hard drive failure. And when I suffered the hard drive failure, just going back years now, I had to recover the information. And so recovering information, you know, there are multiple types of hardware failures that would make your information inaccessible. But I suffered that, that sense of dread because I, true story, had multiple years, I think it spent a decade, of pictures that I had taken in many different areas of my life, trips, things like that. But could you imagine what would happen for those who do, and we you know we're all obviously up to our necks in the political sphere, so I know probably each and every one of us in here has gone to the Secretary of State's website and have looked at your voting totals on a precinct by precinct level. Could you imagine what would happen if, whether it be you or one of the great citizens of Minnesota, went to the Secretary of State's website and wanted to look up historical data, which again is tapping into data at rest, and it was inaccessible? That violates actually another of the tenants I spoke about last week. Do you remember the, the three I spoke about? CIA, another three. And that CIA acronym stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That would be an example of the lack of availability because one of the tenants in cybersecurity is to ensure that information is available when it's needed. And so if you went to the drop-down arrow and tried to select a historical data selection and it was inaccessible, that would be bad. It might even, depending on who you are, what the, your job responsibility is, if it's a citizen or a member of your staff, they might suffer one of those panic attacks, a mild panic attack or an overwhelming sense of dread. But you know, another example of availability would be, or a lack of availability would be if the entire website was down. Now, I don't know where the Secretary of State is hosting, web hosting his website. It could be on-prem, or it could be in the cloud. Now, if we want to talk about the cloud, I'm telling you, it's a whole nother area with different risks, different vulnerabilities, because on-prem, hosting on-prem and hosting in the cloud can be different. And I'm sure most members in here have heard about the cloud. And on-prem is short for on-premises. So is it being hosted here? Is the website for the Secretary of State being hosted on-prem or is it hosted in the cloud? And, if, we, and if, if you or anybody went to the website and it was on, have you ever experienced page cannot be displayed? I know that, yeah, I saw at least one hand. I see a couple heads nodding. Page cannot be displayed. What happens to you? What happens? Do you murmur under your breath? Do you get frustrated? What if it's time-sensitive information that you need? If it's the Secretary of State and you went to the, the pay, in fact, you know what? We recently had the government shutdown on the national level. True story. During the shutdown, I went to NIST. NIST stands for, Na I think it's National Institute for Standards and Technology, if my memory serves. Okay, and I'm being confirmed, that's what it is. 
I went to NIST, and it's a government organization or a quasi-government organization. And I went to the website because I was actually looking for some standards information that I needed. That's one of the things they do. They publish white papers on different standards. And guess what happened? It wasn't page cannot be displayed. It was this information, this website is currently unavailable due to the government shutdown. I could not access the information I was looking for in a time sensitive manner. Now, I'm very resourceful, so I was able to find my information in an alternative location, but that would not necessarily be the case with the Secretary of State's information. There may not be and likely isn't an alternative source to obtain information. You know, and a lot of this has been focused on voting, but we know the Secretary of State does more things than just voting. And we know the Secretary of State is the one where we register businesses, for example. Now, I, Representative Nash asked me to yield, so I cannot ask another member to yield. But I, I, I think it would be worthwhile to know, does this in any way impact or would it benefit the additional responsibilities that the Secretary of State has above and beyond just the voting registration system. So for example, here's just one example how they might both benefit. Let's say that it's two completely segregated sets of information, but they might both, both the data system for voting and the business aspect of the Secretary of State's data, they might both be behind a common firewall. And so the, the, the data would be protected for both data sets or data centers or servers, however, databases, however it's being stored, by using the funds here to perform upgrades to the firewall. And so what have we covered? We've covered, just in recap now, you know, when, actually when I was a teacher, one of the things that they, they taught us, and, and actually I failed, I failed because one of the, the principles of a good presenter is you tell your audience what you're about to say, then you say it, and then you tell them what you just told them. Toastmasters. Now, is that, is that Toastmasters? Is, okay, I, I, did, I was not a beneficiary of having gone through Toastmasters, but uh, my good friend, Representative McDonald, is saying that's what they teach in Toastmasters. Now, I didn't tell you what I was going to tell you, but I told you so now I need to recap and tell you what I just told you. That's the, it's repetition, because we know learning is repetition. In my time here in the legislature, we know cybersecurity. I've experienced by many members, not all, but many, eyes seem to glaze, glaze over real quickly when talking about this topic. So that's why repetition is important, because that's how we learn. So I started the conversation with the three forms of data like three forms of water. It can be transmitted, it can be processed, or it can be stored. And the different methods for protecting, or there are different methods of protection of the digital information in the different forms. Some of them overlap, but some of them don't. Then we spoke about, or one of the things I mentioned was authentication, the, the three forms something you know, something you have, which is a token like the badge here that we, have, that we all have, and something you are, biometrics. Spoke about CIA here, I just touched on that, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Oh, backups. I didn't mention backups. <laughs> backups. Actually, so I went on a tangent about the, the computer forensics and having to recover data. That's how, uh, see, the so, so in fact, so most may, may not, may not uh, know in here, but I have so many things on my plate. When I was, I had the privilege of being elected, I had to, something had to drop off the plate. So after having taught college for seven years, I had to give it up, unfortunately. So I'm not teaching college currently. So I have a lot of pent up 
uh, energy of, of teaching this information because it's, it's super exciting. In fact, I get an adrenaline rush. I'm hoping some of you, likewise, get an adrenaline rush when you hear this stuff. So backups. Why are backups important? Well, I explained some of the examples of the overwhelming sense of dread that I'm sure some have experienced in here, I have, when your, your information is not available, especially if it's personal pictures, like in my case. But it could just be your email, could be Word documents, could be Excel documents, it could be your business documents. You might have information in business documents that go on inaccessible because of a hard drive failure. So that's the reason why backups are important. Now, many people I speak with, they back up to a flash drive, also known as a thumb drive, a removable drive, and backing up information from your machine to the flash drive is one method. I've spoken to others and they do it to an external hard drive. Essentially, just a glorified flash drive, it's just larger capacity. What's the difference between a flash drive and an external hard drive? Uh, you know what, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. But you back up the information to an external source. This is in a, in a consumer application now, like those of us at home. But what do you do? What do you do with that flash drive and that external hard drive? Do you set it right next to the machine that you just backed up? What happens if you suffer a fire or a flood or a theft? And both now the, the source, the primary source of the information and the backup would be damaged in the same event. Now you've lost all the information. And so one of the basic principles after you back up is to move it off site. Now in this particular example, I'm physically copying it to an external source. So now it's incumbent upon me to make sure to move that external source to an off site location. Well, you know what I used to do and actually I'm guilty of now and just the fact that I'm saying this I'm going to indict myself, and it might be a motivation for me to resume a previous activity, and that is I would actually take that external hard drive that I backed up once a month, and I brought it to the office with me, and I, and I locked it, and I had a secured location at the office. So my personal data from my house laptop that's at the house, it, the backup of it is now in the office. So if my house suffered a fire, the backup wouldn't be damaged. If there was a theft of my primary information, the, I would still retain a backup. Now, I was doing the backup once a month. So the backup once a month, I, there, a, a risk would happen, for example, on the 29th day, just before my next scheduled backup, if that's when I suffered a theft or a fire, I would be losing 29 days of data because I would have to go to the office, bring the external drive home. It was 29 days old, right? And so all emails, Word documents, Excel documents, anything that I may have been working on, poof, except for computer forensics. But that's a whole, I mean, if we want to get into how to recover bits from a platter, we can. And I know that that's what something the Secretary of State would have to do potentially if data at rest was not being backed up. There would have to be a computer forensics engagement in order to recover the information. But that's moving from an external hard drive, as I mentioned, to an external location. But that is not the most effective way to do it. Some, and I don't mean to promote any particular brand, but one commercial that I've heard is Carbonite. And if anybody's heard of the Carbonite commercials, it's a way of backing up information to the cloud that I mentioned earlier. So you're not actually backing it up from the primary data source to a secondary data source for storage. 
that you then have to go through the trouble of bringing to the office or here to the legislature or wherever you might store it off-site, but it backs it up to the cloud. And not only is it more efficient by backing it up to the cloud because it's off-site in that capacity, it's also happening more frequently. Because while I'm not a Carbonite customer, for example, Carbonite, just one of the many technologies out there for backups, my understanding is it's done on a daily basis at a minimum. And so the Secretary of State would be incumbent upon backing up the information to an off-site location, whether he's hosting it on-prem or in the cloud. But those are just some of the examples that we've spoken about uh, or are concerned about in the cybersecurity field, Representative Nash. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and Representative Lucero, I think that was uh, very illustrative. I think that was very helpful for the members here to, to hear those, that valuable information. But I, I think, members, he may have missed a couple things. And I want to share some of my expertise in some of the travel that I've done lately, talking about some of the other things that are new in cybersecurity that the Secretary of State is going to need to be careful of. To the motion on the refusal to concur with correct, the Senate Madam amendments Speaker. to House File Number 14. Yes, correct, Madam Speaker. Thank you. And, and members, here's the thing. When I was in committee all last year talking about this bill, and as we were hearing from the Secretary of State, the thing that we heard the most was urgency, Representative Nelson. Urgency. We have to get this done. Uh, and, and I agree. So much so that I expended a lot of my own political capital, and you heard me talk about this last year, uh, how I would come to the floor or talk to people in committee, and they'd give me the, uh, the Heisman Trophy stiff arm and say, Jim, go away. But there have been some things that uh, the Secretary of State needs to get right, and I want to talk about GDPR. Uh, for those of you that haven't followed this, this is an EU issue, and it stands for General Data Protection Regulation. And this is going to be germane because what that says is an EU person has the right to be forgotten, and that's a very interesting notion here in the U.S. Uh, but regulation recently was passed in the state of California that the Secretary of State is eventually going to have to comply with. And uh, that was passed, and it's called the Consumer Privacy Act. And it was passed by uh, Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin, who I met at an NCSL task force on cybersecurity recently. And here's what it says. And this is to Representative Lucero's point of backups and various forms of data and where is it and, and how is it constituted. Because a voter here in the state of Minnesota might have the ability to, to request that they be forgotten. And to be forgotten essentially means that any record of you as a voter in this case or in uh, one of the, the business databases that the Secretary of State has, you have the right, members, to be completely removed, not only from the working copy of the data, but not just a, an on-prem backup or a cloud backup or even tape. Representative Lucero forgot tape. Many in my industry and in our industry have said that tape is dead, and, and members, please know that it is not. Uh, tape is now a long-term off-site cold archive for data. But here's what the Secretary of State is going to need our urgency, since we're talking about this particular issue. The urgency here is that the Secretary of State is going to have to begin familiarizing himself with this, because it's a very important thing. Lawsuits have been filed on GDPR and the Consumer Privacy Act. A voter could register for, to, to be a voter, and then they're going to move to, I don't know, let's say um, South Dakota because taxes are better there. They can lodge a request to have their name removed from the database completely, and the Secretary of State is going to have to comply with that. That is not being done today by the Secretary of State, and that's why this money we should get going to get into the hands of the Secretary of State because we don't want to put our Secretary of State's office in jeopardy of being sued by somebody, and it would be an easy lawsuit for that individual to win because they could file it. It's clear that they haven't been removed. They might be removed from the active database, but the, the cold archive, they will have to stand it back up, remove that individual, and then send it back to archive, and that's very important stuff. We want to make sure that if a voter in, uh, in my district or Representative Lucero's district or the Speaker's district uh, might want to be forgotten, that's, that's something that we need to, to really consider. But back to the urgency issue. 
Representative Nelson is asking us to take longer. And we don't want to really belabor uh, this spending. We don't want to belabor anything, but sometimes we have to ask the, uh, the proper question. So I wonder, Madam Speaker, if uh, Representative O'Driscoll would yield to a question. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll will yield. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, you were the chair of uh, government operations last year, and we heard this, uh, this issue as a sense of urgency. Uh, you know, members and Representative O'Driscoll, I'm sure you had the, the number of meetings that I had regarding this issue. We were asked to very quickly pass a bill out of committee to get money to the Secretary of State. And mind you, this was not by lobbyists. This was not by anybody other than the Secretary himself. Uh, and Rep Representative O'Driscoll, if you could tell us um, maybe the, the thought process behind the bill that you built last year, putting this money into it, and the fact that we really needed to get that money into the hands of the Secretary of State, and what a travesty you might think it is about where we are today, if you would uh, help us with that, Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Nash, thank you for the question. Um, when we had last year with the Government Operations Committee, uh, which had oversight for a lot of, of committee work, and, uh, as well as um, we had elections, we had government operations, we had a lot of different areas, and that's now been broken out into three committees this year. But how the structure worked last year was um, Secretary Simon and I sat down and we were visiting, and, and I was very uh, much keeping Representative Nelson, who was the DFL lead at that time, in the loop on what was going on. And we've had a, in this chamber, and uh, with the last uh, boy, the last two governors, last 16 years, a strong bipartisan need to have legislation hit the governor's desk, and both of those governors had said that that we want to have strong bipartisan support. Anything that has to do with elections, anything that has to do with campaign finance reform or, or or updates, and so I was keeping Representative Nelson in the loop very very closely. Well, all of a sudden, here we are, close to the end of session. And Congress passes a bill that makes money available. Now, we didn't think we were going to get this money because of the original HAVA Act back in 2004, when, they, when it came about, we had money that came and the Fed said, only, only one time we're going to give you this money. So we're very pleased to be able to learn about this. So my phone rang and it was Secretary Simon. He said, Representative O'Driscoll, we've got some great news. I'm going to share it tonight at committee. So literally in the basement hearing room over at the SOB, I'm sitting on one side of the, the, the uh, presenter's table and Representative Nelson is sitting next to me and we have uh, the bill up in front of us. And we're looking at the, um, what was the uh, uh, elections omnibus bill for the, for the year. And Secretary Simon said, came in and said, great news. Congress passed and President Trump signed a bill that made money available for helping voters to be able to vote. And he said, this is great. He said, and there's a 5% match. 5% is all we have to come up with to get almost $6 million here in the state of Minnesota to help secure our data and the uh, statewide voter registration system. And we're all pretty excited about that. Even 5%, if you, if you do the math on it, it's a pretty small number. And when, you, when we think about that, we say, well, maybe what we should try to do is get that into the omnibus bill. So we were working on it. We were working with the Senate, trying to get that going and trying to get everything wrapped up at the end of session. And by the way, the two authors that were on that bill, that's very similar to the one that the Senate sent over to us, were myself and, and Representative Nelson. And so we heard from the secretary, and the secretary said, you know what, this is a good deal. Let's, let's do this. Well, then, if things couldn't get better, then the secretary came back and said, we've been working with the feds. And we've already spent money, and they're going to give us credit for that. They're going to give us credit for money that's already been spent. So we, if we could just get that amount of money right now appropriated, that would free up the, the 5 to $6 million for the state of Minnesota. And as a matter of fact, all the legislature would have to do is just agree to let us have the money. we got five years to come up with the match. And right now, we're, we're, the Senate sent over to us pretty much the same language that we had last year, in state government finance, Representative Nelson, the chair, can go ahead and help us work out the other details and incorporate it into the state budget, state government budget with the secretary's office. And we can put the money in and we can get the process going tonight. I noticed that Leader Dowd isn't on the floor right now. Maybe he's gassing up his car. Maybe there's a chance that we can get over to the governor's office today. I'm not 100% sure, but, um, well, Representative Nash, if, if you have any other questions, but that's kind of a, you know, a little bit of a history on what we've done so far to get us through the 18th session, which brought us to the 19th session. 
Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, again, I, you know, our elections are important. We've all been sent here by our constituents through the mechanism of election. And I hear from all of you who have stopped me in the hall or come by my office or we talk in the committee room that cybersecurity is important to you and you want to lend a helping hand to the issue. But members, this is your chance right now. Uh, I'm sure the secretary is probably ensconced in his office watching this on TV. One, because he used to be a member of this body. He's probably a little jealous that he doesn't get to participate in this conversation today. Uh, but members, this is your chance. Here you have the opportunity to reflect the urgency of the secretary. Uh, and for those of you on the other side of the aisle, you know, this is your secretary of state who is kind of watching you. If you remember, one of my favorite movies is uh, Field of Dreams. And in there, Shoeless Joe Jackson says that he can kind of turn when he anticipates the, the play of the batter. Secretary Simon is waiting in his office, members. He is set up for you to put the ball in play. He's looking at you. He's waiting. He's probably wondering, when will this happen? And, you know, that's a good question. But he's waiting for you to put up a vote tonight to tell Representative Nelson that, no, you, you shouldn't refuse to concur. You should actually concur with the Senate. You know, you've heard from... Uh, Representative O'Driscoll about the urgency that we were uh, shared last year. I mean, we spent hours, Representative O'Driscoll and committee, I remember, hours upon hours hearing from the secretary. And we've heard from Representative uh, Lucero here on, on the, the mechanisms that we go through to actually provide that security, because a lot of you just take it for granted. You know, the mark of good IT is it just works. You know, that's what we in the industry say. Well, we just want our folks who are, who are consuming the, the service that we provide, they just want it to work. They want to come to the office and they want to plug in or, or turn on and they just want to know that it works. But members, if we do not give this money to the secretary tonight, there is a distinct possibility that you could have a denial of service attack that uh, the, the secretary was not foreseeing. You don't want that on your watch. You don't want that to be uh, the hallmark of your time here in the House of Representatives. You don't want to say, hey, uh, you know, I voted not to concur, and we went to, to, uh, to conference committee, we took weeks, and suddenly a denial of service attack were to happen. And a denial of service, I'm, not, I, I'm tempted to ask Representative Lucero to yield to describe what all goes in to a DNS attack, but I, I'm not. Well, maybe. I'm not. But members, you don't want to be the one who ushers in that. You want to be the one that stands tall, says to the Minnesota people, I took the responsibility of the office that you sent me to do to make tough decisions. And I got to admit, it pains me sometimes to agree with the Senate. It does. You know, uh, I, I tell my friends who come down to visit that the first thing that you should do when you interact with the senator is to speak slowly, sometimes utilize flashcards. But this time, I'm, I'm going to go with they got this right. And members, you don't want to be the one that, uh, that shows that, that they didn't get, they did get it right. You want, to, you want to confirm what they said. You want to agree with them tonight, get this bill to the governor. The governor might be waiting for this. But, you know, I, I have the Uber app on my phone. I'm happy to call an Uber or Lyft, either one, and we can get this over to the governor uh, tonight because, members, you want to stand tall and show that you're capable of making tough decisions. Sometimes you gotta, you got to tell the chair, Chair Nelson, I'm going to stand up against you tonight. Uh, we think that this is so important that we got to get this going. So with that, Madam Speaker, I, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the time, and I will, uh, I'll sit down now. Any further discussion on the motion to refuse to concur? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll.
Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 73 ayes and 50 nays, the motion to refuse to concur prevails. Reports from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. <clears throat> Winkler from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, pursuant to Rules 1.21 and 3.33, designates the following bill to place on the calendar for the day for Monday, March 4th, 2019, Thank and you. establishes a pre-filing requirement for amendments offered to the following bill. House file number 232. <coughs> The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 476. The clerk will report the bill. 
House file number 476, number two on the calendar for the day, an act relating to insurance. There are amendments at the desk. I recognize Representative Stevenson, who will explain the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the many members who are co-authors of this bill, and in particular, I want to thank Representative Zerwas for his leadership on this issue. I appreciate it. I know that the families who have been impacted by the family exclusion also very much appreciate it. When I was growing up, my parents had a 1987 Forester inboard-outboard speedboat. And in the summer, we'd spend most weekdays on the Mississippi River between Champlain and Coon Rapids, swimming, tubing, water skiing. I remember one day, I was sitting in the back of the boat. I don't remember who was driving, but my dad uh, was up on the sun deck because my brother was going to go tubing. He was out in the tube, and my dad was letting out the rope. None of us realized at that time that the rope was looped around my dad's foot. Uh, until the driver kind of accelerated just a little bit too much, the rope snapped. My dad, realizing it, dove over the back of the, the propeller and into the water, uh, just narrowly clearing it. He said that when he was in the water, he could feel the turbidity of the prop against uh, his foot. He had made that split-second gamble, and it really uh, paid off for him, because miraculously, he was unarmed, unharmed, a bit shaken. I'm pretty sure he was... Uh, just a few feet, if not inches, away from really serious injury, if not death. I was probably 12 or 13 when that happened, uh, so insurance wasn't really on the forefront of my mind. But I asked Dad uh, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this bill, did you, did you have liability insurance on that boat? And he said, yeah, Zach, I mean, your mom and I have always been really responsible about this. We carry insurance on our boats all the time. And I said, Dad, if you had been a little less lucky when you jumped over the propeller, would you have expected that your insurance would have covered you? And he said, of course. That's why you have insurance. Uh, my parents sold that Forester more than a decade ago, and the insurance policy that uh, he had at the time is long gone. But the odds are that Dad wasn't protected. As it turns out, in Minnesota, like most other states, uh, most boat insurance policies exclude liability coverage for the insured person, that's the boat owner, as well as people related to them by blood or marriage. You might be shocked to learn that. I certainly was. I think that people should get what they're paying for. And when you buy a boat insurance policy, you do it to protect the things you care the most about. I'm sure I'm not the only parent of small children who thinks about this situation and shudders. The bill before you would fix this problem by prohibiting insurance companies from excluding people from coverage under boat and umbrella policies just because they are related by blood or marriage to the insured person. This might seem like a common sense idea to you, and I expect if it does, it's because this is already the case for car insurance in Minnesota. In fact, unlike boats, car insurance policies in Minnesota have been required to cover everyone since 1973. I suspect that opponents of this bill will argue that this will increase the cost of boat insurance, and that could be true, but I doubt it. The bill insur allows insurance companies to increase premiums if there's an increased cost, but only they can only increase prices if they show data justifying that increase to the Department of Commerce. And we're just not talking about that many accidents. Uh, Minnesota has over 800,000 boats uh, that's the most of any state, another reason that we can be proud to be in Minnesota, most per capita boats. Uh, last year, there were 92 accidents. Uh, I did not misspeak, only 92 accidents with over 800,000 boats. And keep in mind, boat insurance is not mandatory in Minnesota, and not all of those accidents involved a family member. So the amount of accidents that would be impacted by this bill are, are smaller than 92. And in any event, I would gladly pay, I would gladly pay members the marginal cost of ensuring that my six and four-year-old daughters are protected when we go out on the boat this summer, and I suspect that the overwhelming majority of boat owners in Minnesota feel the same. Now, members, many of you are aware of the very compelling story of Courtney Godfrey, who suffered a terrible injury in a boating accident almost two years ago. 
Member Courtney is here in the gallery with us today, and she's been a tireless advocate for this bill since her accident and told the Commerce Committee in detail about what happened to her. Courtney had been married to her husband for just seven months, and one summer day, she was out on a boat with her friends and family on Christmas Lake. They enjoyed skiing and tubing, and at the end of the day, it was time to head home for a cookout. Now, Courtney and her husband were and are responsible boat owners. They told everyone in the boat to have a seat and to hang on tight. But despite that, Courtney was thrown from the boat as it made a sharp turn. Courtney told the Commerce Committee that she felt a blunt impact shortly after hitting the water. She thought she had hit the bottom of the lake and broken her foot. But when she reached the surface and held her foot above water, she realized the terrible truth about what had happened. She had hit the inboard propeller on the boat. A happy family day on the lake had turned into a life or death moment. Courtney's sister used a ski rope as a tourniquet. Her husband frantically called 911, pleading for them to hurry. As her sister held her shoulders and begged her to keep breathing, Courtney feared for her life. Thankfully, Courtney lived, but her life is going to be different forever. Her foot was not salvageable and had to be amputated. The costs to her and her family have been overwhelming. There are the obvious medical bills, but there's so much more. The physical therapy, the home modifications, the list goes on and on. Her health insurance is good, but it doesn't cover everything. Courtney and her husband thought that they were covered. They had boat insurance, and just to be absolutely sure, they also had umbrella insurance. You can imagine their shock. You can imagine their confusion and their anger when they learned that the insurance that they were paying for did nothing to protect them when tragedy struck. Now remember, members, Courtney was a newlywed. She'd only been married seven months. If the same accident had happened the summer before, she would have been covered. Remember also that there were other people in the boat. If any one of them had fallen out, they would have been covered. Courtney was only not covered because she was married to the boat owner. That's the only reason she couldn't get the benefit of her insurance policy, the benefit her husband paid for. That's not right. We can change it. Members, this is a simple bill. It should not be a controversial bill, and I'd ask for your vote. The member from Sherburne, Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for, for bringing this bill forward. This is a bill that I've worked on uh, for the last uh, year and a half as well. It's something that as we talk about uh, for the average Minnesota family, the idea that uh, we live in the land of 10,000 lakes, uh, where recreating and participating uh, in water uh, activities and boating is a summer pastime. And uh, if you talk to people, and I remember when this bill was first introduced last year, I talked to a lot of people. My family had a cabin. I grew up on the boat. I talked to my in-laws. I talked to my neighbors, my cousins, <coughs> my uncles, everybody I spoke to was stunned to find out that the policy they had to cover their boat, in fact, had a family exclusion. And when I talked to an insurance agent in my town, they said, well, you could get a policy that doesn't have a family exclusion if you specifically request it. I think you can get one through the Lloyds of London. Members, I guarantee you there are not that many Minnesotans who ensure their pontoon 
or their ski boat or any other watercraft in Minnesota, except perhaps one or two lakes through the Lloyds of London. So the idea that that would be the insurance option, if you want to cover your child, your spouse, or yourself in your own insured watercraft just seemed bizarre to me. And the other thing that I think is bizarre is the fact that out of all of those people that I spoke to, they were just so surprised that the coverage that they purchased and had been paying premiums on for all of those years wouldn't actually cover themselves or their loved ones. And so members, without passing this bill, when you're in my district and you watch on any Thursday or Friday, the stream of boats being pulled up 169 as you head to the greatest concentration of recreational opportunities in the state of Minnesota. Know that in fact what's happening is they are pulling nothing but empty promises. Because your insurance will not cover you. You will not be covered. Your family will not be covered. And that is a shame. And it's something we can fix today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Jurgens moves to amend House File Number 476 as follows. The amendment is coded A3. The member from Washington, Representative Jurgens, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. So first of, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker. Uh, first of all, there are quite a few similarities between an auto insurance and a boat insurance. I first got licensed to sell insurance in about 2003, so I'm going to walk through that a little bit, just a little understanding of what is in a policy. If you, most of us have, have probably looked at our declaration pages at one time or another. If you can just visualize that declaration page, you see numbers, numbers might be different, but it's for example, 100, 300, 100. The first 100 is a part of the liability bodily injury portion of the policy. If you are at fault, let's just use a, an auto act, uh, policy for now. It works the same. This part of the policy works the same for both. If you are at fault in an accident, you roll through a stop sign, uh, you're inattentive while you're driving, you do something that causes an accident and someone else gets hurt, you have $100,000, if those are your limits, that will be paid to that injured party because of your negligence. The second number, 300, is per accident. So up to three people might get $100,000 until you hit that $300,000 bodily injury maximum. Again, you're at fault, you caused this, someone else was hurt, and this would go to pay for their injuries, lost wages, doctor bills, and so forth. And the third number on there, again, in this example, if it's 100, that goes for property damage. So if you're in a boat and you hit another boat and damage it, um, if you have $100,000 on that limit, that's what would pay for the other boat or multiple boats or a dock or whatever else that you might hit. Now on a boat policy, you also have the option to purchase medical coverage. And in the state of Minnesota, different carriers have different limits on their medical coverage. But that's an option that you can buy. If your agent is doing their job, they're going to offer that to you. If they explain it to you, you should buy it. It's good coverage. You should never be under the impression that your liability limits are going to cover you or a member of your family. 
This is for other people. Now, if you go back to your auto policy, now remember when I, when I talked about the 100, 300? Well, you could have on your boat policy or your auto policy, uninsured motorist, underinsured motorist. Now take that same example, and let's say that you were driving, you run a stop sign, or the other guy runs a stop sign, and you're hurt, so you sue the guy for damages, for medical, for lost wages. But he doesn't have any, insur any insurance or he doesn't have enough insurance. Now it comes back to your policy. That's where that kicks in and you actually can collect off of your own policy because you have the uninsured motorist or underinsured motorist coverage and the other guy didn't. Now we've heard numbers in, that there are 800, over 800,000 boats in Minnesota. 818,000, I believe, is what the DNR tells us. But I've always been under the impression in my line of work that about 400,000 boats in Minnesota are insured. So 40 to 50 percent, depending on which numbers you look at, of the boats that we see going up to the lakes and on the weekends, we see them going up and down the Mississippi River, don't have insurance anyway. Now, if this bill goes through, the premiums are going to go up. I don't know how much. That'll be up, for the, up to the actuaries to determine. But if premiums go up, do you think more boats are going to be insured, or do you think fewer boats are going to be insured? I think fewer. This is a, a complicated issue. And we hear compelling stories. Um, and we all want to be able to do something when there is an injured party. What this amendment does, the A3 amendment, is first of all, the language in the bill, let me refer to it here. The language in the bill says the effective date, this section is effective the day following final enactment and applies to policies in effect on or after that date. What the A3 amendment does is it changes that, the enactment date to January of 2020. And then in the meantime, it establishes an advisory council to review the potential insurance uh, rate premium increases to consumers, proposed rate adjustments, and determines just what impact this policy change would have. And reports back by November of 2019 so that we can make a fully informed decision going forward with an enactment date. So the A3 amendment, again in summary, changes the enactment date to January 1st, 2020 and it creates an advisory council to review this. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I'm gonna ask for a no vote on uh, the A3 amendment. This amendment just kicks the can down the road unnecessarily, uh, and uh, we don't need an advisory group to study this narrow issue. This issue's understood, and I'd ask for a, a no vote on the amendment. The member from Morrison, Representative Cresha. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and members, I rise to support the amendment. Members, uh, when I first came here, uh, Representative Murphy was over there as the majority leader. And I remember pushing a policy that I really wanted. And I'd heard some compelling story, and there's no question what happened to bring this here was tragic. And those stories can compel us to move policy, but the fact of the matter is we still have to make that policy good. And we still have to make sure we get it right. And this is not the day where we're, we're just splitting along party lines and saying we're going to stand up. This is about getting this right. We heard this come through commerce. This is complex stuff. And there's a lot involved with how we're going to do. Representative Jurgens has the right approach. Put an advisory council together. We've already heard that of 800,000 votes, only 92 or 82, whatever the number. So we have a limited amount of tragedies that are happening in accidents, they are still covered, okay? To say that there is no coverage is not true. 
Some, many of those happen without family exclusions. Maybe those happen in other accidents. But you also have your umbrella policies, you have your health insurance. There is coverage. It's just, did you get exactly the compensation you wanted? Did you get the claim? That's what we have to make sure we get this right. Because we're about to change policy for 800,000 voters. Are we going to get it right? I'm telling you, I, I fear we're going we're gonna to get this wrong if we rush it. Why would we do that when we have the ability to slow this down? How many of you have heard the adage, you don't want to make laws fast because you're going to get them wrong? That is true. I, I remember sitting with uh, Mr. McCormick uh, in the research, and he said to me, Representative Krisha, this place is designed not to pass laws because you have to get it right. And back to my story, I remember talking to Representative Murphy in my first term as I'm pushing this policy and I'm trying to get something through. She turned to me and she said some of the wisest words that ever stuck with me. She said, Representative Krisha, just do good work. Members, we still have to do good work. Emotional stories bring policy. Emotional stories bring change to law. And, and that's great. Representative Stevenson, I thank you for bringing this bill up. We need to think about this. Nobody here would disagree that we need to make sure members or consumers are educated about the insurance they cover. But we also need to make sure that we don't do it in such a rash way that we upset the apple cart and change what's going to happen without them knowing. I've looked at this bill. I, I, I think there are things that could be done. I think there's a better way we could approach it. The advisory council here could come back with some suggestions. I called my insurance agent. Thankfully, I was able to because I knew about this, and I asked. I said, well, how does this work on my boat insurance? He said, all you have to do is get a med pay increase, which will cost you $20, and you can get a twenty-five dollars to $50,000 uh, cash cap on that. So if your other insurance doesn't cover it, you will have twenty-five dollars to $50,000 available to you to get that. No lawyers, no lawsuits. My wife and I are not in a courtroom fighting each other, and it costs 20 bucks. There are ways to do this, members. This advisory amendment, Representative Jurgens, thank you for bringing it up, is a very good amendment. In fact, I think it helps the bill. It doesn't take away from what Representative Stevenson is trying to do. It doesn't take away from still trying to get to the end effect of good policy. It just taps the brakes a little bit so we get it right. So we get it right, members. That is more important, and we can still pass this bill with this amendment, still feel good about the progress, have tapped the brakes just a little bit, so that when the policies and, and the changes go in effect, it's done correctly. So Representative Juergens, I support this. I, I believe a green vote for this amendment would help this bill, and I, I would support that. The member from Ramsey, Representative Lush. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Would the author of the amendment yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Lush. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Juergens. Can you tell me, do you have any injured consumers uh, on the advisory group that you're proposing here? I'm trying to understand who some of these people are. Do any of, are any of them uh, uh, injured consumers or represent injured consumers? Representative Juergens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Lush. Uh, the members of the advisory council, first of all, they would be appointed by the Commissioner of Commerce, but they would, there would be five members, uh, the Commissioner of Commerce or that, the Commissioner's designee, a person appointed by the Insurance Federation of Minnesota, a person appointed by the Minnesota Medical Association, a person appointed by the Minnesota Defense Lawyers Association, and a representative of the insurance producer industry. Representative Lush. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, Representative Juergens, you know, I, I applaud your effort to put together a commission, but uh, I'm looking through this list. Now, you got designee of Commissioner of Commerce, but first you got a representative of the insurance industry. Uh, second, Minnesota Medical Association. Okay, they have a stake in this, too, because they're the ones getting sued if they, if they do something wrong. Uh, Minnesota Defense Lawyers Association. These are the lawyers that are defending the insurance companies. Uh, and then you got a representative of the insurance producer industry. I, I don't see anyone who's, this looks to me like a very one-sided commission. 
Uh, and, and I can't understand why, if you were serious about tapping the brakes, as was stated, to have people talk about what we should do in this, that you wouldn't have a, a truly representative commission to discuss uh, what we should do. Uh, members, I was thinking about this. When I looked at the list of everyone deciding um, who, who should be advocating for uh, or uh, the, uh, the injured parties or the insurance companies, I was thinking about this email that we all got around 2 o'clock today. Uh, and the email was relating to the Compensation Council. Legislative Salary Council prohibited communications. So the people deciding your salaries are going to meet to decide what your salaries are. Remember we passed that constitutional amendment? Uh, and the email was reminded, reminded us that we can't talk to them. Um, it didn't tell us who they were. I don't even know who was on the council, but I'm probably going to go look that up to make sure I know who I'm not supposed to talk to for the next four months. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be great um, if the members of the Compensation Council for, for my salary would be like, you know, my wife, my daughters, maybe me? That'd be a great council to have to decide what my salary would be. I'd love that. Um, but it certainly wouldn't be fair, uh, Representative Juergens. Um, and, I, and I can be, I think my constituents can be assured of what kind of outcome it would result with. So um, I'm not going to support your amendment for that reason. Um, there are other reasons not to support it as well. But I, you're, just, you're only representing the insurance industry uh, and the people who want to maintain the, the money and not do the payouts. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Juergens yield to a question, please? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative Juergens, you were talking about having been in the insurance industry since 2003. That would put you probably 15 plus years in the business. And a question I guess I have, and something you said kind of sparked a, a little thought in my, my process here. You said that this coverage that we're looking to mandate and put into policies right now already exists. I was wondering if Representative Juergens could expound on what current coverage the industry is offering and um, tell us why that isn't something that consumers are taking advantage of today. Representative Juergens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, they are taking advantage of it. Uh, it's the medical insurance. You have the option when you purchase a boat policy to also buy medical insurance. Um, it's in different increments, different Different uh, carriers have different limits. I know you can get uh, $25,000 of medical coverage on a progressive boat policy. You can get $50,000 of, of medical coverage on a traveler's policy. Um, if we were to do anything, and, and I, I just thinking of this now, I wish I would have thought of it soon enough to put this into an amendment. But you know, we could have uh, required that that carriers offer a higher medical limit and give people the option to buy. They have the option to buy now. They have the option to buy medical coverage for themselves and their family on their boat policy. And they are doing it. They are purchasing it now. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Juergens yield to another question? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Juergens, um, in the... Uh, well, I call the bill set up when we were learning about what the bill was and what it does and those kinds of things. It was suggested that people aren't getting what they're paying for. It sounds to me from, from what you're telling the body today that there's actually two different levels. There's the base policy for liability, which means damage I do to you or I injure you in some way, versus a second set of coverage that's already available in the marketplace where I become injured or a family member of mine becomes injured because of uh, the... Uh, being on the, the, the watercraft or as a result of the watercraft. So my question is, um, with that coverage already available, is there an easier way for us to be able to inform consumers when they're visiting with agents to either purchase or do a, what I sometimes refer to as a file review? I'm not actively involved in the industry selling, but I have trained people in the state of Minnesota for 25 years in different insurance, real estate, appraisal areas. So I'm pretty familiar with state statute and policy structure from the, uh, from the ISO. And I realize each company kind of specializes that. And if you could tell me a little bit more about how that would work. And then secondly, if you could maybe just um, talk about what some of those premiums might be for the coverage that you referenced from, from your experience in the industry. Representative Juergens. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative uh, O'Driscoll, easiest way to think about a, a policy, again, whether it's an auto policy or boat policy, there's many similarities, but think of it as just different buckets, buckets of money that you can pull from, that you can draw from. It's not so much a base policy and, a, and an expanded policy, it's uh, because the structure of the policy is very similar. So again, the liability portion of your policy, the bodily injury, is going to have a bucket. And you might have $100,000 in that bucket, or you might have $250,000 in that bucket, but that's for liability. That's for your negligence, and it goes to pay someone else if, you, if they're injured because of your negligence. So that's, a sep that's one bucket. And then the, the second bucket would be a per accident. So again, you might have 500,000 in that bucket to, to, care, or to uh, uh, compensate multiple people if they're injured in that accident. The third bucket is for the property. And if you have $100,000 in there, that's the limit. That's all they're gonna pay. And I encourage all of you to take a look at your auto policy. I'm not gonna stand up here and try to sell any policies tonight, but you should take a look at that and find out what you have for limits. You might be surprised. I was when I got into this. I learned I had terrible limits. I was not very well insured. It's up to the agent to meet with you on a regular basis to tell you about the coverages, tell you where you are exposed. That's the agent's job. And you as a consumer should expect that out of your agent. Another bucket is the medical coverage. You can choose to purchase that or choose not to purchase that. But it's offered on the, on the, the boat policies. So again, it's not so much that it's a, a base policy and that it's a, uh, you know, a more premium policy, if you want to call it that. Um, the policy structure is there, and it's what you want to purchase, what you choose to purchase, based on, hopefully, information that you're getting from an insurance professional. Now, I did bring one definition. Bodily injury liability insurance pays for injuries you cause to another driver if you are at fault in an accident. Bodily injury does not cover, bodily injury does not cover the medical costs of injuries you may get in the accident. It is considered a third party insurance since it only covers other drivers and passengers. So I hope that answers your question. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Madam Speaker, um, if Representative Jurgis could yield to one more question. He, in, we've been hearing references to auto policies. In an auto policy in the state of Minnesota, we have a coverage called PIP, Personal Injury Protection. And although it's not completely identical to the, li to the uh, medical coverage that we're talking about uh, with the watercraft policies, but it is pretty close. It has a lot of similarities on there. In the state of Minnesota, do we charge an additional premium for having that coverage? In other words, because it's a required coverage and everybody has to have it, I'm assuming that the actuaries are accounting for that when they're determining the premium. So there wouldn't be any confusion for folks when they're looking to purchase auto coverage because it is mandated by the state that a carrier and a company and an agent must offer the PIP protections at the state minimums. And at this point, I don't know that we necessarily need to go into that because most folks aren't going to be taking their insurance exams. That's my world. But we could maybe get some credit for people toward that if, if they hang around long enough with us tonight. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I kind of wish you hadn't brought up PIP because that opens up a whole other can of worms and I don't want to give anybody else ideas on a boat policy. So Minnesota, how many of you heard that, have heard that Minnesota is a no-fault state? You've heard that, right? You know what that really means? There's one little portion of your auto policy called personal injury protection, or PIP. And what that means is if we get into a minor fender bender and I have a sore arm, I break my arm, I need stitches, something like that, my policy is going to pay for me. It doesn't matter who's at fault personal injury protection, that part of your policy is no fault. There's $20,000 worth of coverage for that, what I'll call, again, minor injuries. 
Now, there's some other stuff, too. There's another $20,000 that's available to use for lost wages or if I can't mow my lawn because I was injured in a car accident and I have to pay somebody to do it, there's some funding in there for that or to clean my house or things like that that I am not able to do. And you can also increase that $20,000. It's called stacking. If you have two cars on your auto policy and you stack the coverage, then you have $40,000. If you have three vehicles, you have $60,000. Uh, I think probably about 95% of the policies that I sold, I put stacking on there because it's good coverage. It's better for the consumer. Both policies, you have the option, some carriers will offer that, and you have the option to buy it. It will cost a higher premium. It's not required on a boat policy. But that's the only part of your auto policy that's no fault. When it comes to what I was talking about before, the bodily injury, the liability, we do care who's at fault then. Those are the more major injuries. When you talk about fixing your vehicle, comprehensive coverage, collision coverage, again, whether that's a boat or, a, or an automobile, doesn't really matter. Then it, it matters who's at fault. If the other guy's at fault, they fix your vehicle, you don't have to pay a deductible. If you have to pay for it out of yours, you have to pay your deductible. So it does matter who's at fault. So there is a uh, misconception when people hear that Minnesota is a no-fault state because that's only one part of your policy. And it's that $20,000 on a base policy that covers your injuries. I don't know where Representative Lilly went, but there he is. If, if Representative Lilly is riding in my car and we're driving down the road and we get into an accident, I'm driving, Representative Lilly is hurt, his policy is going to pay for himself, not mine. That's the only part of the policy that follows you, the driver. It doesn't follow the vehicle. And it's, what, again, if you're getting in or out of your vehicle, I've had a client claim, a personal injury protection claim, they didn't want to do it, the doctor is the one that pointed it out to them. And I'm not kidding here, it was a little old lady getting into her car after church. She had one leg on the parking lot, one leg in the car, and she slipped and fell. Because she was getting into her vehicle, her auto policy paid for her chiropractor appointments. We used to have a drive-in theater in Cottage Grove. You go to the drive-in theater on Friday night or Saturday night, and you see kids sitting, sitting, laying on top of the vehicles to watch the movie. If they were to fall off watching the movie, their parents' auto policy would pay for their injuries. It's, personal injury protection is anything having to do with while you're riding in a vehicle, getting in a vehicle, getting out of a vehicle, and it follows you. It follows you. It doesn't matter whose car is involved at that point or whose boat you're in if you choose to purchase that. It does get a little stickier with boat policies because not everybody has it. But that, and I appreciate you asking the question, I think, Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Juergens, you've been very informative today, but I do have one more question, set of questions I'd like to run by, if I could, on the, on the topic. Um, in the bill setup, the bill author indicated that Minnesota, in its auto area, has had since 1973 this style of coverage that he's advocating, which we've now defined as the PIP or personal injury protection coverage. Without having to get into a great amount of detail, but we will recess. Can you tell us what has happened to we'll those limits later. since 1973 on personal injury protection? The, where you're talking about if someone is injured, you stated a number, and then if there was other kinds of things and essential services or lost services and those kinds of things. And folks, remember, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Representative Juergens, take us back to 1973. Tell us what those, what those were, and then tell us what they are in 2019, if you would. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I should probably take a refresher class of one of yours. Uh, the numbers, I thought it was 1978, not 1973, but whatever it is, um, I don't believe they've been adjusted. 
So there are underlying limits in there, and I'm talking now not the, not the $20,000 bucket that pays for your injuries, but the other bucket that pays for other things. Um, and it's like $250 a week for um, lost wages. It's not a lot. Uh, I, your point is that they haven't changed since 1978 and they're still very low. And I would say that that's true. I can't tell you exactly what those limits are. I could find that for you and give it to you, though. But inflation is, we've had uh, a bit of inflation since 1978. So they, whatever those limits are, they don't buy what they used to. Members, I just want to remind you that it's the custom and usage of the House that during debate, um, you address the presiding officer. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And maybe I won't even have to ask Representative Juergens to yield on this. But 1973, that, that was suggested by the bill author. 1978 is suggested by the amendment author. Um, the point being, we're looking at something that's 40 years old. You had about a lot more medical coverage for yourself in 1978, let's say, than you will in 2019 for medical or for, for, your, for injuries that you have or for uh, replacement services. When I talk about that and I explain to the students that I teach, here's how this works. You know what they say? Well, why doesn't the state of Minnesota increase those? And I say, well, let's take a look at that. They cost, every time you increase coverage, there's a premium increase on that. And we hear statistics in the state of Minnesota that in the auto-related realm, there are at least, eh, depending upon who you talk to, three to five percent or more of vehicles on the road that don't have insurance. Not the proper insurance, they have no insurance. I simply ask them, if we were to raise those, those limits, would that increase premiums? And they go, well, I guess it would. And then I say, end of the day, does that have us have more people insured because of affordability of that? or less people insured. And they go, ah, I see what you're saying. There'd be less people who would be, be insured because the cost goes up and with budgets, people might try to um, go it on their own or drive a vehicle on the road where they don't have at least the state mandated requirements. Thank you. Any further discussion to the Juergens Amendment? Representative Juergens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to request a roll call. Representative Juergens requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Juergens. The bill author said that this is kicking the can down the road, and it is. It's kicking the can down the road because this is a big decision. And we want to get it right. As Representative Cresha said, government is intended to move slowly so that we get it right. We've waited years to de debate this, to, de to, uh, to debate it here on the House floor, and I think a few more months to get it right is kicking a can, the can down the road, but I think it's something we should do. I urge a green vote. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the Juergens Amendment. Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 49 ayes and 74 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted.
There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report <clears throat> the amendment. <clears throat> Jurgens moves to amend House file number 476 as follows, and the amendment is coded A4. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A4 amendment, all this really does is it says that you can't double dip. If you receive payments from any other source due to injuries, that you cannot also claim that under the liability portion of a policy. Uh, as we talked about, there is medical coverage that you could buy on your boat insurance. You could have health insurance. There could be other sources. But this amendment just says that you cannot double dip and be paid twice for the same injury. The member from Hadpin, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, I would ask you to vote against uh, the, uh, uh, the A4 amendment. Uh, there are other operations of Minnesota law that prevent the kind of double recovery we're discussing here, uh, and so I'd ask members to vote against the A4 amendment. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would speak in support of the A4 amendment. It's need to be made clear that double dipping is not allowed on this policy. You know, this, or this uh, bill, this bill has tremendous inf implications uh, by taking a one-size-fits-all to the problem. And I know it was a ser serious accident. I empathize with the family. But as been stated before, there are policies and uh, benefits available on an optional basis that uh, can be purchased. But, uh, you know, when I first started selling health insurance back in 1978, uh, there were people that carried two or three health insurance policies. The premiums were a lot lower, and they were actually collecting from different policies at that particular time. Well, then I think in the middle to late 80s, the law was passed that you couldn't do that. Now, there still are indemnity policies that are limited in benefits and pay a fixed benefit that you can collect from, such as cancer policies or uh, certain accidents policies. But generally on insurance, I think we need to make it clear that there cannot be double dipping on that. So I would recommend uh, support for Representative Juergen's amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Morrison, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and members, I know this is boring. I, I know this is that long drawn out, eyes rolling in the back of the head stuff. But that's why this is important. Representative Juergen's is doing a phenomenal job of walking us through insurance. And this amendment, Representative Juergens, thank you. I support this. This is a, should be a green vote. We know there's insurance fraud. We know there is. And part of the problem with getting to this policy and doing it in a rushed manner is we're going to create the opportunity for insurance fraud. Let's not talk about this just in an emotional aspect. It was a terrible tragedy that that precipitated this conversation. But the other side of this is, if we pass this law as it is and it becomes enacted, we're setting up spouses to sue spouses and to create that kind of a situation where that, that's why the family exclusion exists. Because in this policy, there's other areas where they can get coverage. But this bill will set it up so that the one spouse gets to sue another one, and the insurance company is put in the position of defending themselves. You can love or hate the insurance companies, but they're there to mitigate risk. This gets at limiting those opportunities for fraud. We all know the stress that can happen in a tragedy. And then we start to think through, how do I get myself whole again? I've had the same situation. I've had flooding in my house where the insurance didn't cover it. And I, I start going through, how do I get myself whole? How do I get back to before this happened? And the reality was, if I had reviewed my insurance, I would have been whole. But when you're in a stress situation and you start looking for this, people start to think differently, your mind starts to change, and it creates a situation where I'm not really just cheating the insurance company, I'm not really just fraudulent here, I, I'm just trying to get back what's owed to me. So Representative Juergens, what you're doing here is putting some of those protections in and again reminding us the, the importance of going back and reviewing your policies to make sure you're doing this right. Because when something happens and you're not covered, you can't just come to the legislature and fix it. 
We have to do this in a slow, meaningful, thoughtful, deliberate way. And Representative Jurgens, I, I support the amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll on the amendment. All those in favor of the Jurgens amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Runbeck moves to amend House File Number 476 as follows, and the amendment is coded A5. The member from Anoka, Representative Runbeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm reminded today why I did, never wanted to talk with my father about his work. <laughs> he was an insurance agent. It is deadly boring stuff. Yeah, um, but, <laughs> I'm sorry, not to be taken personally. Uh, so the amendment here, though, is, uh, would, would simply say that any recovery um, of monetary damages in this situation is limited um, by, for the attorneys to 20% of the compensation awarded to the plaintiff. So it puts a cap of 20% as opposed to the, the normal, I think it's 33% um, that the awards can go. Um, and I think there's really good policy reasons for why the law is the way it is right now and why these intra-family exclusions exist and why we should oppose the bill. I think that's very clear. We've been told today the bill would incentivize collusion between relatives and it really serves as almost an incentive. And we know that wasn't the case in this, this unique tragedy, but it would serve as an, as an incentive for family members to sue one another. Uh, there's a, a greater expense in all of the insurance uh, involved here because these two claimants, or the claimant has much more exposure to the other party, uh, their spouse. And so that greater exposure just automatically increases the cost of coverage and increases the cost of insurance for all of us. Uh, it will increase lawsuits. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that this is about more litigation um, and that opportunity is going to increase for that. We have an already burdened legal system uh, and we're just gonna pile on more onto that system. And as we've heard today, there's already a, a opportunities to buy the coverage for your own family, uh, and certainly people should be encouraged to, to do that. But I think this amendment is, uh, would make the bill better and more uh, tolerable, uh, even though it is, you know, it's been a policy for a long time, and there's, there's good reasons for it. But I urge your support, and um, I, Madam Chair, would, Madam Speaker, would request a roll call. Representative Runbeck requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will Madam be a Speaker. roll call. The member from St. Louis, Representative Olson. Yes, Madam Speaker, I rise to a point of order under 3.21A as this bill introduces a new subject and expands the scope of the bill. Advice. Madam Speaker of Advice. Representative Swidzinski, I'm prepared to rule. I have studied the amendment. I have reviewed the bill. Madam Speaker. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just, uh, you know, I think it's obvious. You look at the, uh, the rules and you look at the content of this amendment. It is clearly within the bounds of the amendment. I don't believe that it nearly uh, expands it to the extent at which Representative Olson it speaks to. And I think you should rule uh, not in favor of the motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Swazinski. I have studied the amendment. I reviewed the bill. I have considered the advice. And I'm ruling that the point of order is well taken. Madam Speaker. I would, I would appeal the ruling of the chair. Representative Nash appeals the ruling of the speaker. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I, I agree with Representative Swinzinski. This is going to create lawsuits. I think that it's completely germane for us to talk about contingent attorney fees. Uh, and Madam Speaker, I think that's something that we want to make sure that we get right. Again, we've been talking all night about how we want to make sure that things get right. 
Um, I think that this is a, a very solid amendment. It's certainly germane to the bill. And uh, Madam Speaker, I would ask for a roll call. Representative Nash requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker. A no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would stand and, and uh, support uh, voting to overrule the speaker. We're talking about liability insurance, okay? That involves negligence and lawsuits and legal action. It's definitely pertinent to our discussion. I don't see how we can rule that it's not when it's an integral part of the, uh, of the uh, process we have in force here in the state of Minnesota as far as to address these types of problems. So please vote uh, green to over overrule the speaker. Thank you. The member from Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And uh, I, I understand the rule game. I, I, you know, let's not take the vote. Uh, but the reality is what we're trying to avoid by doing the rule game is what's really happening in this bill. If you have an insurance claim and the lawyers take 33 to 40 percent of that, why? Why would, we, why would we think that's okay? When you can go back, and like I said, I called my insurance agent, and he said 20 bucks, you'd increase the policy. Parliamentary so inquiry, Madam Speaker. Representative Winkler, for what purpose do you rise? Madam Speaker, what order of business are we under? We are on an appeal of the ruling of the Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Krisha. And I'll, I'll keep it to that. I, I respect that. But again, if, if we're just avoiding votes because we don't want to take the hard vote and the reality of what it is, I would vote to overrule the Speaker. The member from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, this very clearly is germane. As Representative Grunhagen said, the entire bill, the entire amendment has to do with negligence, proving negligence, lawsuits, so why would we not include the attorney's fees? We can debate whether or not we want to accept the amendment. That's fine. Let's continue that debate. But there should be no debate on whether or not it's germane. Because this clearly has everything to do with the amendment that Representative Runbeck brought up. So I urge a green vote on the Nash amend movement appeal. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I was just going to ask to clarify what a green vote is in for and what a red vote is for. for the body. A yes or green vote upholds the ruling of the Speaker. A red or no vote goes against the ruling of the Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal. The clerk will close the roll. <laughs> there being 74 ayes and 49 nays, the, uh, the ruling of the speaker is upheld. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Jergens moves to amend House File Number 476 as follows. <clears throat> the amendment is coded A6. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Vote policies in Minnesota are not very well defined. And what this amendment does is it puts into place circumstances under which a vote policy can be canceled. For example, the insurance company can lower your limits 
They can cancel for non-payment of premium. If they determine that you lied on your application or you falsified anything or you didn't fully disclose your driving record, your claim record, that they can cancel the policy with proper notice. That's the key. If you fail to disclose anything on the application fraudulently, if your driver's license is under suspension or revocation, what this bill does is it just outlines the circumstances under which the insurance companies can take those actions with proper notice to you as the boat policy owner. Would Representative O'Driscoll yield for a question? He's not sure. He will yield. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, you teach classes, insurance classes. Do you have a section on boat policies? Representative O'Driscoll. I'm sorry, Madam Speaker. Could Representative Jurgens repeat the question, please? Representative Jurgens. Representative, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, uh, in your, your, your insurance classes that you teach, do you cover boat policies in that class? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Jurgens, we do have some conversation about boat policies, yes. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What are some of the, uh, Representative O'Driscoll, what are some of the differences between the auto policy and a boat policy in the state of Minnesota? Representative, Representative O'Driscoll. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Jurgens, one of the major differences is where they're operated, obviously. You have the situation where a watercraft is going to be on bodies of water. It might be a river. It might be a stream. It might be a pond. It might be some other kind of reservoir, depending upon where you're, where you're uh, you know, globally talking across the country on this. Secondly, when you talk about an automobile, you have different um, acceleration, deceleration that can happen with those motors, which insurance companies look at very carefully because um, the faster you go, the more likelihood there is of injury or if something goes awry, that um, the injury or loss of property uh, escalates tremendously. What also can happen is when you rate the, the vehicles, such as a speedboat or a powerboat versus a fishing boat or a kayak, those are kinds of things that insurance companies are going to look at. And in each one of those areas, they take a look at where those are used. They oftentimes will put limitations in the policies too that say you cannot use the, or if you are operating this vehicle doing X or Y, coverage is not in force or there is no coverage. Coverage is, is muted at that point given whatever that, that situation is. And there are those kinds of things that are in a policy that would be an auto-related policy as well, Representative Jurgens. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I urge a green vote on the amendment and ask for a roll call. There's an amendment to the amendment Amendment to the amendment. Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Representative Jurgens requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk <clears throat> will report the amendment. <clears throat> oh, Driscoll moves to amend the Jurgens amendment to House File Number 476. The amendment to the amendment is coded A12. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, the question that Representative Jurgens just asked me about some of the considerations in a, an auto policy versus a, a watercraft policy that the industry looks at, or the ISO, the Insurance Service Organization, which is a national group that does model policies for homeowners, auto, different kinds of, of coverage, including watercraft coverage. And one of the things that I mentioned was that coverage can be limited or coverage could be muted, uh, meaning that there's no coverage that would be granted under the policy if certain situations had occurred. 
And given the fact that um, we are very concerned in the state of Minnesota with the operation of vehicles, whether they be watercraft or they be uh, over-the-road vehicles that might be uh, on a highway or a, a neighborhood street, whatever the case may be, that one of the things that we want to make sure that we're looking at is the likelihood of injury could go up if someone's in an altered state, if they've consumed alcohol uh, or consumed alcohol in excess or have other kinds of, of chemicals that are in their system that could um, impede their ability to be able to operate the vehicle, react accordingly uh, as it relates to that. And so what I'm asking members to consider in the A12 amendment, and I would also like a roll call on that, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. And so one of the things that I think if we want to try to do, if we're trying to align some of the benefits that are in an auto policy to a watercraft policy, then we should also subject those, at least for the actuarial review, they can also look at canceling a policy if someone uh, was intoxicated, we follow basically the same rules that we do in the state of Minnesota. When a law enforcement officer pulls someone off the street or arrives at an accident and they determine that there might have been alcohol involved, and so they ask for a blood alcohol analysis, and in the state of Minnesota right now, if one says, hey, I don't want to take that, that uh, test, we've got, uh, we've got an issue. That means that those folks are going to lose their license in the state of Minnesota, or if they, um, the tests come back that they're in excess of 0 0.08, Minnesota's current limit for alcohol um, intoxication for the operation of, of, a, of a vehicle. So all we're trying to do is to just continue to make that consistent so it may help the industry be able to determine uh, or at least get some, some um, as I like to put it in class as well when I talk about these things, put the bumper guards up at the bowling alley so we don't hit any gutter balls and that we're really making sure that we're getting what people need. So thank you. Member from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and would uh, Representative Driscoll yield to a couple questions? Would Representative O'Driscoll yield to a question? He would. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Driscoll, I want to draw your attention uh, to your amendment to the amendment. And on line 1.5, it says has submitted to. Um, that's a bit nebulous in terms of, I, I wouldn't understand over what time frame you're talking about there. So I'm wondering, under what circumstances would that uh, submission be appropriate, uh, given that he might be boating on a Sunday, but would have been uh, to a party or something three days earlier? What, what constitutes submission in a, in a time frame that's appropriate for law enforcement? Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Albright, um, my assumption would be that under Minnesota law, whenever a police officer or law enforcement officer uh, arrives at a scene, they will begin to do a protocol of investigating and assessing the situation. And if they determine at that time that there has been uh, alcohol involved, or if they arrive at a, a uh, clinic or a hospital needing care and law enforcement is brought in, brought in that there would be a blood alcohol and or other chemical uh, assessment that would be done. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would uh, he, uh, the member continue to yield? He will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, on line 1.8, you talk about the person refusing to submit to a test. Uh, if you're out on the water, uh, you could be uh, under the influence or not. What liability or responsibility are you under to submit to that test? Is it the same as if you were in a motor vehicle? And, and, and to what responsibility uh, for safety of the people on boat, just like in a car, are you responsible out on the water? I, that seems a bit um, odd to me. Thank you. Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Speaker, um, before I proceed, just a uh, parliamentary item. I will remove the roll call on this. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll withdraws, withdraws his request for a roll call. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To Representative Albright's question, um, 
what this does is this is actually the same language that you would see operating a motor vehicle in the state of Minnesota with, when you're on uh, public right of way. So law enforcement has that authority to be able to go in and ask for these kinds of tests. What we're saying is that this could give the insurance company the opportunity to assess the individual who they provided coverage for, and if in fact they did refuse to test and or if they um, uh, did submit to a test and they were over the legal limit of 0 .08, that the insurance company with proper notice could cancel the individual because they could deem them as a higher risk to the insurance company and all insurers that would be in that risk category. And I will, I will spare you the details of the law of large numbers this evening and how insurance companies and actuaries go through that process. Unless, of course, Representative Albright, you would like me to do that, I'm happy to. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If you would continue to yield. He will, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, on line 1.10, you make reference to uh, Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 or its metabolite other than marijuana. And I'm curious as to why there is an exclusion for marijuana uh, when we're looking for, under the guise of 1.5 through 1.7, under the influence uh, of a chemical, uh, alcohol, or a controlled substance. Um, what say ye to that, Madam Speaker? Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Representative Albright. No better question asked today than that question. And here's why. When you take a look at the Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 drugs, there are tests that, um, that can be run in a medical lab when you draw blood from someone. The problem that we have with marijuana is there is no reliable test to determine intoxication. You can test for it in the bloodstream. You can see if it's present. But there's no way to be able to determine, like you can with a blood alcohol test, either through a field test, which is what law enforcement calls it, or through a, a uh, a medical test where you're drawing blood and you're doing an evaluation on that. And that is why many people in the insurance industry this, this day and age are very concerned about expanding the use of marijuana for recreational purposes because, again, persons may be using these in the operation of vehicles and others, and that could put, put uh, the public and or other occupants in that vehicle. The reason marijuana is exempted, we don't have a test for it right now, Representative Albright, that's reliable for this purpose. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if Representative O'Driscoll continue to yield? He will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, it seems like we're at, at opposite ends because if, in fact, a person were on a boat and he were under, uh, uh, as you say, um, involved uh, or under the control of a, a controlled substance, let's just say, for example, marijuana, uh, and even though it is excluded here, and we don't have a test, what would, what would happen then uh, in terms of the, the, the law enforcement agent saying you are under the influence, but for, a, for a, a substance that's been excluded, how do we reconcile 1.5 through 1.7 with 1.10? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Albright, um, this is an attempt to try to balance the, the situation for the insurance companies where they may have identified a higher risk. And this happens in auto coverage as well. Anyone who's um, been, been involved with a DUI uh, knows that your insurance company is going to cancel you. You may end up having to get uh, insurance from a high risk pool. And this get, begins to move it, us in that direction. Representative Albright, um, if there is an appetite in the body to, to um, include marijuana and to um, further deal with that in a restrictive way, that I'm sure insurance companies and our actuaries would be happy to deal with that. But at this point, there is no reliable test for intoxication for the use of marijuana. And we're seeing that in other states. Accident rates and, and things are going up. I wish I had a test. I wish I could write an amendment that says we now have a test, but I don't have that ability. We're just not there yet. Madam Speaker. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if uh, Representative O'Driscoll would continue to yield. He will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, what in the case of a person who is um, under medical direction to take medical cannabis, where they have a doctor's prescription, uh, let's say it is for chronic pain, 
and they're on vacation with their family. And just before they have left the dock, they took their midday um, uh, prescription uh, dosage of medical cannabis. So now they go out on the water, whether they're boating, whether they're driving or whatnot, but they just happen to be in the boat because now they're pulling their son or daughter. I don't, it doesn't matter, but they're in, the, they're in the boat, they're in the driver's seat, and they get pulled over for some infraction. Let's say that, you know, the license tabs on the side of the boat, you know, don't quite match up, or, you know, they're leaking oil or something that the DNR or something happens to discover, and they pull them over. Maybe it's just a, a life jacket check. Um, and, and they notice that the driver who is under prescription for medical cannabis, his eyes are dilated. And for no other reason, they feel that something is going on with that person that they feel is under the influence. And they say, well, look, I, I'm in my swim trunks. I don't have my prescription on me right now, but I am under a prescription for medical cannabis. And the law enforcement or the DNR agent out on the water says, doesn't matter. I'm still going to take a blood test or something. What remedy or at what point does that individual's rights in a prescriptive sense be infringed upon for no other reason than that it's a controlled substance? Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Speaker, Representative Albright, thank you again for the question. The issue, if you would um, take a look at, well, I'll answer your first question. Again, we should have individuals who are not participating, in my opinion, in the, in the use of marijuana period because it is illegal under federal law. We had uh, issues here in this chamber a few years ago when we legalized marijuana I did uh, for medical use, and I did not vote for that because I said that was going to be the next step to recreational use of marijuana. Um, and that is a problem that we have. And again, it will continue to, to become a problem. But to your question, what happens if someone took their dose, dosage? It's no different than if someone were to have um, consumed cough medicine and a larger dose of that on an empty stomach, not a lot of food. They could also become impaired because of the alcohol or the other kinds of things that are in there. They should not also be operating a vehicle, whether it be a watercraft or whether it be a, a vehicle that's on a public road right away or anywhere for that matter. Continuing on, Representative Albright, I think that um, if you take a look at line 1.50, it says this person had to have been involved in an accident to your question on this or, as it continues, uh, was required to submit to other mandatory tests. So um, that person in your situation would have been excluded assuming that they weren't involved in an accident. Just as we have people who maybe consume alcohol in excess and go down the road, they shouldn't be doing that. They may be over the legal limit. They also um, don't um, get detected unless they're in violation of the law or perhaps get into an accident. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if he would continue to yield. He will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam, Ch uh, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, uh, oftentimes uh, there are uh, uh, purses on board a boat. Uh, let's just say for the ex example that um, you are in an accident, uh, and the person that is driving the boat uh, is under uh, doctor's orders for an opioid. And let's say that opioid um, is such that with alcohol possibly being involved, um, the, the, the driver, or the, the, I guess the, the, yeah, the driver of the boat might, might appear to be under the, obviously under the influence, but of maybe other than uh, alcohol. And you talk about Schedule One and Schedule Two drugs. So what's the difference between marijuana and being under prescription for Oxycontin or an opioid of some nature? Where is the line between, even in an accident where the, the person is being infringed upon their rights under prescription or not, in this case, and how does he verify that he's under that prescription if they're out on the boat and they don't have the prescription with them? Do they have a timeline that they can remedy it? Much like when you are pulled over for uh, a, a traffic offense, you sometimes have 24 hours or so to, uh, if you don't have your policy uh, little card with you, that you have an opportunity to provide that to law enforcement 
to have that fine because you're always supposed to have that in the in the in the car. So are there remedies in your amendment or in this bill for those that are under prescription for uh, Schedule One or Schedule Two, or even in the case that I just cited, medical cannabis? Because I can see a number of instances where there is so much gray area in terms of what a DNR agent or what could have in terms of imposing his will on, on the boat owner, the boat driver, in the context of what he's looking for and what he might or might not find. So if you would elaborate on the safeguards, as you example, uh, the, the guardrails that you're looking to put up. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Albright, a couple of things for you on here. Um, if we think about the fact that we have persons who are taking medications, and the number one thing to remember on here is when you get, go to your pharmacist and you receive your medication, oftentimes on there, there are instructions. There is a label on here that says, do not operate heavy machinery, do not drive vehicles, and gives you some warnings because they know that that kind of medication is going to impair you. If that individual is out operating the, the uh, uh, vehicle on a public road right of way and a law enforcement official was to pull that individual over, again, the protocol would be that maybe it wasn't something where the individual is intoxicated, but they were doing things that were dangerous and they may be cited for other um, traffic violations under one, um, Statute 169, which are moving and motor violations here in the state of Minnesota. The other thing that's important to remember is this behavior doesn't start and stop when you get in your vehicle. This should be in all areas that people have, whether you're operating a motorcycle, watercraft, uh, uh, or other. And again, when you start getting the CDL, commercial driver's licenses, the amount of um, screening and protocol that goes there is much more than it is when you're talking about a passenger vehicle or a non-commercial vehicle. Representative Albright, one other thing just to, um, to help you with a little bit of, gosh, folks are going to become insurance experts after tonight, but um, the, the, when you're citing, if you don't have your proof of insurance, and again, this is something I'm going to pay attention Representative to. Representative Winkler, for what purpose do you rise? Madam Speaker, I move a, a recess to the call of the chair until approximately 9 p.m. Representative Winkler moves a recess to the call of the chair until approximately 9 p.m. All those in favor, Madam please Speaker, say Madam aye. Madam Speaker, I have the floor. Those opposed, please Madam say Madam no. Speaker, Mr. I have Mr. Speaker, the floor. The motion Madam prevails. Speaker. The House is in Madam recess. Speaker. Madam Speaker, the floor had Madam not Speaker. been yielded.